So grab your coffee, grab your snacks, grab your seats. The train is taking off. It's hard to hear that the the tape if you're talking. It would be nice to listen to it a bit. So I no longer had a contract. We had a plan. We had a plan. We had a plan. It was a setback. OK, 
Okay, so that was Crawford, the part, and another clip from the interview with him about his book on cultural pluralism and how that came about. Uh, so now we're start, we're starting another session on that on that very same theme, and our first speaker is um, Professor Dauda Abu Bakar from University of Michigan, Flint. Um, he's the chair of the Department of Social Sciences and Humanities, an associate professor of Africana Studies, and associate professor of Political Science. Uh, he's also uh, has been the chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Maduguri in northern Nigeria. Um, he has a recent or a book from 2017, a co-edited volume on the violent non-state actors in Africa, um, terrorists, rebels, and warlords. So join me in welcoming him, welcoming him to speak. Thank you very much, uh, Aile, for, for that, um, that introduction. I know that um, many of us have already spoken uh, about Crawford and how he touched our individual lives. Um, and, and I think I, I will share a very, a very small uh, story about how he, he impacted me um, and not just myself. Uh, I was sharing with, with Olayenka uh, over lunch about how because of Crawford and the education that I received in, 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 in North Hall, in the political science department, that my daughter is, is, is now here in, in Madison with her own family. And one afternoon, Crawford asked me that uh, I, I should come over so that we can go and watch baseball. <laughs> I don't know anything about baseball as a graduate student, <laughs> what the game is all about. Uh, but he picked me up in his car and we went to Milwaukee. Uh, we watched the game and uh, we talked and he, 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 he bought some lunch for me. And it was not until after that I began to think that one, in the first place as my professor, he needn't have to do that. That's one. Two, that the time he took would have been a time that he would have worked on his other projects or maybe spent time with his family and children uh, or maybe have done other things. But he decided to take me to this game that I never understood anyway, <laughs> right? And it also did cost him his own personal money, his own dollars. And that really spoke to me about his person and the way that he related to me as a graduate student, the empathy, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that it brought uh, uh, to my relationship with him. And through that, that I was able to eventually finish uh, my doctorate program and, and went back to my native country, Nigeria, uh, and, and taught at the University of Maiduguri uh, before eventually uh, uh, coming back again uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the United States. Uh, but what I'm saying is that Crawford, really is a person that recognized the humanity of others. Uh, he went beyond himself uh, to impact the lives of others. 
and I believe that that is a legacy that we need to celebrate, but above all, we need to also extend it to others in our individual uh, our, our lives and, and, and professions and careers, uh, wherever we find ourselves. In other words, what we have seen in him, that we do likewise, you know, uh, that others one day would also gather uh, to speak uh, uh, the same thing uh, about us as we are speaking, uh, uh, speaking about him. Uh, and so, Harry, uh, if I can get my slide started of my presentation, uh, I'll, I'll appreciate it. Um, my, my, my paper is about uh, sectarian identity formation and the African, African post-colonial state. And, and it looks at uh, the, Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian case, uh, uh, case, case study. Um, there are, of course, lots of perspectives that have informed the study of ethnicity and the study of the state in Africa uh, from Crawford's major work on cultural pluralism, uh, primordial uh, frameworks, uh, to the idea of state failure, where Reno has done a lot of work. Uh, that helps us in understanding the challenges that African states face. And other theories, of course, about the African post-colonial state is the notion of the authoritarian system, uh, uh, what Crawford calls the Bula Matari state uh, in, in one of his major works, that the state itself, uh, as it establishes domination over society, uh, uh, crushes every form of opposition uh, uh, as it asserts hegemony. And of recent, of course, the democratization literature uh, and, and of course issues of identity politics, which is where uh, my work focuses on how identity really matters but it seems to me that in most of the, 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 the Africanist literature uh, that the issue of religion and religious identity and sectarianism uh, has not been interrogated, uh, has not been looked at very closely as to how this impacts uh, uh, the nature of conflicts in African countries uh, particularly countries like, uh, 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 like Nigeria. And so my work tries to look at the Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian instance. Um, the, the argument that I make is that understanding the African post-colonial state requires a grounded analysis of religious reforms and the processes of sectarian identity formation. In other words, how even within particular religious practices, how sects are formed and how that process of forming sects within uh, uh, Islam in Northern Nigeria, for example, um, could degenerate into violent conflicts. Uh, the 19th century reform movements in West Africa, for example, um, in uh, the map that I have here, you find that by the 19th century, there were these various Islamic reform movements in places like Futa Toro, Futa Jalon, Masina, and then of course the Sokoto Caliphate. And my focus is with Northern Nigeria, which is where uh, as at the 19th century, you had the Sokoto Caliphate. And that 
for one to understand the contemporary Islamist and, and sectarian insurgency uh, in Northeastern Nigeria and the Sahel and, and the Chad Basin, that it's important to see how these religious reform movements and the various sects that, that, that emerge within these reform movements fight each other and eventually these degenerate also into the larger society and violent conflicts uh, uh, that, that, that we are witnessing. And, and Northern Nigeria provides one with, with, that, uh, with that important historical and geographic space uh, of examining these claims that I, I make. And, and so in terms of the history and the context, there was in the in the 19th century, of course, the the the, the jihad of of Sheikh uh, Osman Danfodio, uh, and and it changed the the religious marketplace in northern Nigeria in the sense that you had this attempt by a Sufi Islamic order to purify uh, in courts. Islam as it was practiced in Northern Nigeria in the 19th century. Uh, uh, it was more of a critique uh, uh, of the then way that Islam was practiced uh, in Northern Nigeria by, uh, uh, by, by Sheikh uh, Usman Danfodio and his, uh, and his, uh, and, and, and his, his, uh, his, his, uh, his adherents. Um, he, he condemned the corruption and the exploitation uh, of the peasantry, the unbelief uh, that uh, uh, was predominant. Uh, and, and so the aim was to purify Islam. And then uh, after that, of course, the emirate system was established. Uh, but as we know uh, that, that the, 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 the caliphate itself was overthrown uh, by, by the British, uh, and then the, the system of indirect rule was, uh, was, was, was installed. So the, the next uh, map here shows the region that the Sokoto Caliphate covered in Northern Nigeria and the variant or the strain of Islamic practice that it established was mainly a Sufi sect. Uh, of course, there is also in Sufism, you have Kadria, Tijaniya that were dominant uh, in Northern Nigeria at that time, and up to today, of course, Kano, uh, Sokoto, Kasina, uh, uh, including Borno, uh, uh, that, that the Sufi uh, Islam is the most dominant uh, uh, practice. But it's important to also note that Borno to the Northeast in the Chad Basin area uh, was not conquered by Usman Danfodio. Uh, there was a different empire, uh, the, uh, the Borno Empire at that time, and there were uh, a lot of rivalry actually between the rulers of Borno and the Sokoto Caliphate as to who really is a pure or practices pure Islam, right? Uh, uh, the rulers of Borno were criticizing Uthman Danfodio, and there were exchanges between the two of them. Uh, but fast forward, you, you have then by the 1920s uh, into the 50s and then independence period, the rise of another strain of Islam in Nigeria's, uh, in Northern Nigeria uh, by, by Sheikh Abu Bakr Gumi, of course, by no reason uh, a, a relation to me, but um, we share the same uh, surname uh, that was practicing, that advocated for the Salafist uh, uh, type of Islam. And the thrust of that is that it introduced yet another sectarian identity within Northern Nigerian Islam 
uh, what uh, uh, Tarje Ostevo calls the politicization of purity. In other words, the whole idea of who is a true Muslim and who practices the purest form of Islam. Abu Bakr Gumi and his followers began to criticize those that are practicing Sufi in Northern Nigeria and the emirs, traditional rulers and clerics that the type of Islam they were practicing is actually not a true one. Just as Uthman Danfodio had done earlier on uh, in the 19th century. And of course, uh, through lots of radio and cassette uh, 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 teachings that he would record began to spread that strain of Islam in Northern Nigeria. Uh, he critiqued uh, the existing Sufi Islamic orders. Uh, and most importantly, uh, in terms of Gumi's teachings was that he introduced within Northern Nigerian Islam, the idea of takfirism, that is that if a Muslim does not practice the pure type of Islam in his definition, that it is legitimate for other Muslims to kill that person. Oh, you see how dangerous it can be. Uh, as far as the relationship between Muslims and Christians, of course, it's even a different thing. Uh, but when it comes to the idea of who is a pure Muslim, that Gumi is teaching by introducing takfirism uh, uh, into Nigeria's uh, uh, Islamic marketplace, um, exacerbated that sense of violence towards anyone uh, that is not practicing what, according to him, uh, is the pure form of Islam. And that was what led to the emergence of what is called the Izala sect in Northern Nigerian Islam. He began to mobilize a lot of support. Uh, they established a headquarters in Jos, in Plato, uh, uh, that is predominantly a Christian part of Nigeria. Uh, and so from that time onwards, the 1970s through the 80s, you had a lot of outbreak uh, of sectarian violence uh, uh, in, in Northern Nigeria between Sufi and followers of the Izala movement. But then from 2000, when Nigeria transited to democratic rule, um, you had a debate around establishing Sharia law. And about 19 states uh, in Northern Nigeria adopted Sharia law. Of course, the governors were using it for political purposes because they noticed that one of the ways to uh, get votes from the population would be to say, well, uh, we are establishing Sharia within the state and then the governor will suddenly become popular uh, and uh, he would get a lot of votes and then get, uh, uh, get, get, get elected. And that is the context within which uh, Muhammad Yusuf, who is the founder uh, of what came to be known as Boko Haram emerged. But Muhammad Yusuf also began to critique not only the Sufi sects as well as the Izala sect, but insisted that pure Islam would be practiced by those who follow the Sunnah. So he began to establish another sect again uh, that came to be known as al Sunnah that was criticizing all these other uh, 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 Islamic sects that have been existing in, in, uh, in, in Northern Nigeria. And so he became the founder of Boko Haram 
Um, he was supported by political elites, uh, particularly the governor of Borno State, uh, uh, Ali Modu Sharif at that time, strongly supported Muhammad Yusuf. Uh, at one time, the followers of Muhammad Yusuf uh, were part of the campaigns of the governor, uh, since they are seen as source of votes. And um, by 2009, of course, you had the outbreak of violence uh, in Maiduguri, uh, in, uh, in, 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 Borno, in Borno State. And, and the central aspect of, of Muhammad Yusuf's teaching, one of them is this notion of al-wala al-bara, by which he meant that adherents of the sect would have complete loyalty to Allah and a complete disavowal of all others, right? Um, and of course, takfirism was also central uh, to what, what Muhammad Yusuf uh, was, was advocating. Uh, and and he, he uh, critiqued the Nigerian state, of course, I mean, democracy and, and Western education, uh, uh, all forms of Western modernity, as far as Muhammad Yusuf and his followers are concerned, uh, was perceived as, as being uh, antithetical to that, uh, to that sect. Uh, uh, they, they labeled it as being uh, bidia or, or innovation, uh, and that uh, it, it's, it shouldn't be, 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 uh, be accepted. And, and at the end, of course, uh, the Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian uh, security forces would arrest him, and, and, and that slide is his final uh, um, picture, of course, alive. Uh, by 2009, uh, the, the, the uh, security agencies ended up uh, killing Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Yusuf. And that is how his successors, of course, would carry uh, the violence uh, to a higher level of destruction uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in northern, in northeastern Nigeria. Um, most of the states that were affected uh, would be in the northeastern part where you had uh, the, 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 the thick red dots indicates where a lot of violence and displacement of innocent civilians uh, uh, took place. Um, Yobe, Borno, Adamawa, of course, uh, are also areas that have low level of social and economic, uh, economic development. Uh, it's estimated that approximately 35,000 civilians uh, have been killed and um, about 3.5 million people displaced uh, as IDPs. And of course, the dislocation of the livelihoods of, 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 of uh, hundreds and, and, and thousands of, of, other, uh, of other people. And even within Boko Haram itself now, uh, there is another breakaway faction again uh, that calls itself Islamic State uh, uh, of West Africa province that is led uh, by the son of late Muhammad Yusuf. But one of the, the impacts of the violence has been against innocent civilians. And most of us must have heard about the abduction uh, of over 270 school girls uh, in Chibo, uh, to the extent that that would make international headlines and uh, 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 activists in Nigeria would, uh, 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 especially women groups, uh, uh, would, would have this hashtag bring back our girls uh, as an effort to make sure uh, that they are, uh, they are released. Um, so in, in conclusion, what, what I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to articulate is, is that religion and sectarian identities um, provide us with important lens uh, in understanding African conflicts as well as the trajectories of, uh, of, of state formation 
uh, in, uh, in, in, Af in Africa. And that, that historically, uh, if, if one uh, uh, undertakes a closer uh, understanding uh, uh, or analysis, you find that um, even though Muhammad Yusuf and his supporters would be different from the, the, the jihad of, of Uthman Danfodio, uh, but you find that there is that thread that connects these forms of critique uh, of, uh, of, of modernity. So I, I look forward to, uh, uh, to the uh, discussion and, and, and questions, uh, comments that, uh, that colleagues will, uh, uh, will have. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that very important historical um, perspective. Okay, our next speaker is Tim Longman, uh, who is a professor of political science and international relations at Boston University, and is also the director of the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs, uh, and also interim director of African Studies Center in the Party School. Uh, his research focuses on state society relations, especially human rights, uh, transitional justice, uh, religion and politics, and gender and politics, as well as the politics of race and ethnicity. Uh, he's published two books with Cambridge University Press, one, Memory and Justice in Post-Genocide Rwanda, 2017, and this book re received the prestigious Herskovitz Award, the, the best book in African politics, or African studies, rather, um, given by the African Studies Association. Uh, and then he also won the Christianity and Genocide in Rwanda. He also wrote the book on Christianity and Genocide in Rwanda, 2010. And now he's working on a book uh, comparing church-state relations throughout Africa. And so his talk is entitled The Politics of Identity in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you. It's always lovely to be back uh, <clears throat> at Wisconsin uh, and to see so many familiar faces, uh, even though they are a little more wrinkled than they were the last time I was here. Um, as those who heard me talk before, 15 minutes is a challenge for me, so I'm going to set a little timer here. Um, so uh, as we've talked about, Crawford Young was uh, recognized as an expert in a number of areas, but two of the main areas that he focused on were Congo. Uh, and the politics of identity. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> those two topics are very closely uh, tied together. Uh, in his uh, phenomenal book, The Politics of Cultural Pluralism, he starts it with a story of being challenged to identify himself as either Mbala or Pende, uh, and then uses that example as a way of reflecting upon uh, the categories of uh, identity um, and mentions in particular that by the time he was writing the book, that difference between the Mbala and the Pende was completely irrelevant, uh, even though it was very important at the time that he was there in the early 1960s. Um, he then uh, you know, uses the, the first chapter that he discusses as a case study for uh, the politics of cultural pluralism is about, about Zaire at the time. Uh, and he goes into great depth there about the, the, the history of the changing relationship of uh, uh, different identity groups with the state and the flexible nature of the state. Um, his two books on Congo, uh, the, the first politics of the Congo, uh, and then his book with Tom Turner on the rise and decline of the Zarian state, both have chapters on ethnicity uh, and much of their analysis focuses on this. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as he continued to have an interest in this topic, uh, he recognized um, that while his work was foundational, uh, there was continued development in the field of identity politics. Uh, he recognized some of the responses to his own work, um, some of the anthropologists pu pushing back and suggesting that identity is somewhat less flexible than he suggests. Uh, he acknowledged the work of Benedict Anderson and others who were talking about the constructed nature of, of identity and how once it gets constructed, it is, is not easy to just dismiss it. Um, and in his uh, book that, that Gina Sapiro has a, a lovely piece in that she talked about, The Rising Tide of Cultural Pluralism, uh, he sort of lays this out and suggests that um, his own thinking has been revised, but he never wrote again about identity in Congo. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is just review uh, briefly 
some of his theory about uh, identity based on his, his study of the Congo. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, my own research in Congo and, and look at some of the, the work on identity that has uh, come since. And then finally, just think comparatively about the advantages and the limitations of Congo as an example, as a lens through which to think about identity. Um, as, as some of you may be aware, I uh, came to the University of Wisconsin thinking that I would go to Congo. Um, I had studied Lingala uh, with Ayamba Bokamba at the University of Illinois, and I uh, had my research clearance and was all ready, had my plane ticket bought and was ready to go to Congo in September of 1991 uh, when there was troop rioting throughout the country that targeted foreign nationals, and so I could not go. Um, so. Uh, just kind of sat around for a few months to see if things would calm down in Congo, and they did not. So I ended up going to Rwanda um, because someone on my committee said it was a nice, peaceful little country. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I did eventually get back to Congo. Uh, and so I've actually been spending a lot more time doing research in Congo over the past couple of decades than I have in Rwanda, where I'm persona non grata because it's a nice, peaceful little country. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to draw a little bit on that. Let me first, Joe, mention sort of what what... Crawford Young uh, thought uh, based upon his Congolese research about the nature of identity. Um, in, his, in his three pieces, the uh, chapter in the politics and culture of uh, cultural pluralism and his two chapters uh, in the book on Congo and the book on Zaire, uh, he looks at a, a series of factors. First, he's interested in the way in which uh, in Congo, there were for the most part, not very clear identities prior to colonialism. There were a few states that did have some aspects of identity that were associated with them. But the vast majority of the Congolese people lived in societies in which the borders of the state were porous and where there was shifting and where people did not think of themselves necessarily as part of a national or ethnic identity, uh, but instead thought of themselves as a lineage group or a clan or, or some other thing. Um, and the effect of colonialism, uh, even in the uh, relatively mediocre version of indirect rule that the Belgians used, um, pushed people to identify themselves in various ways. He looks at the com combined role of missionaries who standardized languages uh, and therefore helped create linguistic boundaries by drawing together different dialects into a single dialect. And then also the Belgian administrative function requiring people to uh, list an ethnicity on identity cards and on other sorts of documents um, and the indirect rule which needed chiefs. And so sometimes they had to be created in societies that didn't have chiefs. And as a result, these identities uh, began to emerge in Congo, even if they weren't all that meaning for, meaningful for people. He then looks at three factors that ended up giving meaning to the identities. Uh, the first is urbanization, which he focuses on a lot. One of the things that was very pleasant about working on this paper was going back and rereading all of his work. Um, and I at least said something about, about him actually uh, bringing together ideas from others. And I really was struck by that in reading this in a way that I had never realized before, that other people had written on urbanization and identity and, and Crawford draws them all in, in a way that I thought this was his own original insight, which I'm sure it was at some level, but it was also a brilliant reading of other people and, and, and bringing their ideas together in a way that made something more of them. Uh, at any rate, he, he talks about urbanization and the degree to which coming into the city allowed people to think about who they were close to, that is people who had a similar language, who had similar customs, who came from somewhere near where they were from, uh, and those who spoke a language they couldn't quite understand and who had strange practices and ate foods they weren't familiar with. Uh, and, and therefore in the urban setting, people got a, a sense of their identities. He then talks about two factors that made those identities politically salient. The first was a sense of relative deprivation. That is, if people had a sense that there was another group that was getting it better than they were, it became grounds for resentments. Uh, and then the second thing is ethnic ideology, where when a, a group had a, a intellectuals who developed an idea of their long past and their history and having a strong tradition, that these were two things that helped to mobilize the salience of ethnicity. What he noted was that this was not uniform across uh, the, the DRC, that, that in fact, there were a lot of peoples whose identities were there, but they never became all that politically relevant. Um, they weren't really mobilized, but there were a few groups um, who really did uh, at various times uh, become mobilized. So for example, uh, the Luba Kasai uh, were a group that uh, faced, uh, they, they 
had initially been a group that had been marginalized, um, that had suffered from uh, Tipu Tip's uh, slave trade that had decimated their population in some ways. And so when European missionaries arrived, they associated themselves with them and connected themselves to that, and therefore were, some of the, were one of the first groups to get a lot of education and got administrative positions. And so uh, as colonialism developed, they found themselves in a much better position uh, situated to other groups that had once been uh, more powerful or wealthier than they were. And that created resentments that then pushed uh, in a couple of different places. And Lulua, which is a group that speaks Luba as well, but had a different political tradition. Um, there were attacks on the Luba Kasai as they were chased out of uh, Kananga and, and rural areas as well. Uh, and also in Katanga, where the Luba Kasai uh, were targeted in. Uh, what, what Young focuses on in particular is this period uh, of politicization as independence is approaching and in the early independence period. Uh, and then there were also a couple of groups of Luba Kasai were one of them that developed an ethnic ideology. Uh, the Bakongo were another that talked about the tradition of the Congo kingdom and that these were things that helped to develop their, their sensitivity and politically mobilize their identity. But in fact, what he saw in Congo was that there were many identities that weren't mobilized, that weren't salient. And some that became salient at one period became less salient later as the things shifted. And so what he noted was that the political context really mattered a lot. That political competition and state policies and other things uh, mattered. As he got into uh, his later works um, with uh, the, uh, the Politics of Cultural Pluralism, which is uh, 1976, and then the Rise and Decl Decline of the Zarian State, which is 1986, uh, he notes that things shifted a lot under Mobutu because the horrible experience of independence uh, and, and all of the chaos that was around there, even though most of it wasn't about identity. Um, so for example, the Katanga separatist movement was not driven primarily by a Katanga identity, but by wanting to preserve resources and other things as he suggests, that, that these were things that um, led people to really want a unified state. Um, I know one of my close Congolese friends, someone who'd studied in the United States when I was in high school and we got to know, they thought Mobutu was just absolutely fantastic because he unified Congo. Of course, when they went back to Congo, they said, what happened? Everything is terrible here. Nothing works, but things change. Um, but there was a lot of appetite for a unified identity, a Congolese identity that grew out of this experience. And so many of the identities that had been salient dissipated and became much less important. So last thing that, that Crawford Young wrote on this was in 1985. Um, I've had the good fortune of going back to Congo in 2000, 2007, 2012, 2020, as COVID was coming down. Uh, and to do some research in various parts of the country. Uh, and one of the topics that regularly comes up is the politics of identity. When I first went to Congo for Human Rights Watch in the midst of the Civil War in Eastern Congo, a lot of people that I talked to said, in Congo, we don't have identity politics. We don't fight based on our identity. That's a Rwandan thing that they have imported here and, and imposed on us. And at one level, they're right, right? The war, the, the two Congolese wars were not mostly about identity. Um, they did sometimes mobilize people along lines of identity, particularly the second war in which the Banya Malenge identity became important uh, and association with or against the Rwandan uh, identity became important. Um, the wars were not primarily about that and yet identity did matter. Um, the Mai Mai militia, I mean, one of the things that was interesting is watching how words and identities change. Mai Mai was a term that had a very specific meaning to refer to militia from a, a a narrow group of ethnic uh, communities. Uh, in the time in the early 1990s, that term came to be spread to any ethnic militia except the Rwandan militias. So Mai Mai now is referred to any sort of militia group that's associated with a particular ethnic group is now called Mai Mai. Similarly, Banya Malenge was a term that used to refer to the people from the Malenge Hills in South Kivu. That term has now come to mean any Kenya Rwanda speaking Tutsi from Congo. Uh, and so many people who were immigrants from Rwanda in the 1930s or, or even native Congolese, uh, uh, native Congolese Rwanda phone Tutsi um, are called Banya Malenge. The term is, terms have shifted and identities have shifted in that. Um, that uh, identity mattered, right? That the, the militia groups were defending their people. Um, and in the first war, they allied themselves with the ADFL, the militia group that was trying to overthrow Mobutu because it was in their interest to do so. In the second war, they regarded the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, militia groups that were uh, sponsored by Rwanda and Uganda again as a threat to their identity and mostly allied against them 
Uh, and so you've got fights with the, the new group that uh, uh, came in. Um, there have been a whole variety of ethnic conflicts that have taken place in Congo in the past 30 years. Um, there have been many smaller conflicts uh, in Ituri. There was a period in which there was a lot of conflict between the, the Lendu and the Hema. Uh, there have been at various times conflicts again against the, uh, the Luba Kasai uh, who were targeted in the early 1990s in, uh, in Katanga again. When I was in Katanga two years ago, the amount of anti-Luba Kasai hatred um, that was permeated even with the most progressive populations in the civil society was, was quite striking. Um, there have been uh, small instances, uh, for example, in Ecuador, there was uh, one community in which there was a massacre that took place in 2018, there have been isolated versions like this. One of the things that is striking though, is the degree to which uh, Young's perception about the flexibility of identity within, within uh, Congo has remained. Uh, because uh, in fact, some identities become important, others fade away. Um, and they are um, <clears throat> also uh, mostly localized. Uh, Severino Tassere in her uh, important book on the, the war in Congo, uh, talks about the failure of the international community to recognize the very local nature of conflict uh, and the degree to which often it's very local issues that have driven the conflicts. And, and I think this is actually building very much on the kinds of things that Crawford Young was seeing, that you have these local issues between relatively small groups that are very important to them, but, but aren't part of necessarily a big wider conflict, but get fed into it and, and uh, brought by that. There is a corrective though. Because as Crawford Young noted later, there are some limits to flexibility. The Banya Malenga, for example, are a problem. It is hard to know how to integrate them into Congo today because they're a group that has come to be identified with Rwanda. They allied themselves several times with the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Um, and therefore they are viewed by many people as having no right to be considered Congolese even though their ancestors have been, for the most part, in, uh, in Congo, particularly the ones from South Kivu for 200 years. Uh, and so um, they, uh, having talked to several Banya Malenge activists, they don't know quite what to do. They feel like they wanna disassociate themselves with Rwanda, which they feel has used them. But if they cut off too much, they feel like they're very, very vulnerable. That's a group that uh, the roots of some of the uh, sort of anti-Tutsi sentiment within Congo go back to the Mobutu regime in which he had a chief of staff who was a Tutsi Congolese who abused a lot of people and helped to create this sort of sense of Rwandan entitlement, their relative wealth in, uh, in Northern Kivu um, and there's a variety of things. This is an identity that is not gonna easily go away. The Luba Kasai also are a group that uh, has been uh, uh, targeted fairly consistently and whose identity does not seem it, it, like it's going to disappear in any way or dissipate in any way, particularly because we now have a president who is from the, that group. Uh, and in Katanga, where there was a president from their group for a long period of time, they feel that there's a loss and they have lost political authority. And some of their anger at that is being taken out against the Luba Kasai. All right, let me just say, uh, since my time is up, of course, um, let me just say a couple words about thinking comparatively about the DRC. Um, <clears throat> there are some aspects of looking at Congo that are very helpful for thinking comparatively. It really does tend to highlight some of the flexibility of identity and the degree to which politics shapes identity formation and its salience, and, and also its declining salience in various ways. That said, there are some peculiarities to Congo. With some 300 ethnic groups without a single ethnic group that really dominates, it's unlike a lot of, of African countries. Um, ethnic voting has been much more pronounced in many other countries, whether it's Nigeria or Kenya or Uganda. Uh, the effort at successfully creating a, a national identity that trumps ethnic identities has been much more successful in Tanzania or Senegal. There's some ways in which the Congolese experience really is difficult to generalize um, into other cases. Um, but that said, uh, it, it, it is nevertheless true that some of, some of Crawford's basic observations still really hold. Government policy can matter a lot 
when I look comparatively at the cases of Rwanda and Burundi, uh, you get a sense of how different government choices can in fact affect identity substantially. Rwanda has banned ethnic identity in a way that has solidified it in some astounding ways because many people in the country, they still know what everyone's identity is. And they believe that this is a regime of a particular ethnic group that is excluding another ethnic group. And because they can't talk about it, it leads to these secret conversations in the family and, and frustrations of various sorts. In Burundi, in contrast, there was a consociational model that was put into place that uh, identified Tutsi and Hutu, uh, made sure that both of them had, uh, had representation in government so that they would feel secure. And Burundi, for all of the horrible political problems that it has, um, Ethnic, ethnic conflict has dissipated substantially. It's still there, the identities still matter, but they are less salient than they were before these policies were put into place. Most of the divisions in Burundi now are among the Hutu um, fighting over control. Um, there are lots of other examples you could come up with. The degree to which in Kenya, for example, the different ethnic groups will realign each election to uh, align themselves with a different political party in order to get elected sort of shows you the degree to which divisions that we think of as being hard and fast, like between the Bantu and the Nilotic groups aren't in fact. Um, all right, I've gone over time as I always do, uh, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much. All right, Tom, you can go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad I didn't try to uh, talk about the Congo. Everything that could be said about the Congo has just been said in about 20 minutes. So uh, I can assume that you all know lots about Congo now from uh, Longman's excellent summary of, of, of this. Uh, what I'm going to try to do, and this is not, uh, not really going to be very satisfactory, I can see just looking at uh, how the uh, the images are kind of bleached out uh, on the on the screen. I'm going to talk about uh, mm -hmm. the paintings of uh, Chibumba, who is a Lubaka Sai. I don't have to tell you what that means because you just heard. Uh, who was uh, walking down the street in uh, Lubumbashi, and. Uh, I was a little bit facetious in the titling of this thing, but I, th I think it, 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 it's important because one of the criticisms that I will make of my next door neighbor, Johannes Fabian, is I think he decontextualized uh, what was happening a bit. Uh, that is, Chibumba certainly knew he was a Luba Kasai. Most of the other little guys who came around selling paintings were also were Luba Kasai. It's not literally true that it's a, a, a Luba Kasai profession, painting uh, pop art in, in Lubumbashi in those days, but a very large number of them are, uh, were. Uh, and we, we have get a kind of a confrontation, a confirmation, I'm trying to say, of that in the uh, last uh, few years when uh, a Belgian priest purchased a lot of paintings that had been abandoned by people who were leaving uh, leaving uh, Katanga uh, to uh, presumably go back to Kasai. And those paintings also uh, are, are very heavily painted by people with what I take to be uh, Luba Kasai names. A lot of people whose names begin with Chi 
for example. Uh, in any case, I'm going to show you uh, a few pictures here. You will have seen, some of you will have seen these already before. Uh, and I'll just comment fairly briefly on what I found out. And what I was trying to find out is something that puzzled me at first. And then I figured out, I, now I get it. And what I, what I got was that when he was almost ready to leave Lubumbashi, Fabian sat down with uh, Chibumba in his front room in his uh, house next door to my house and uh, had an extended series of con conversations in uh, Katanga Swahili about the paintings. And this was Chibumba's uh, chance to interpret his art and somehow pass it on. Except if you think about it, it doesn't quite make sense. Was he going to go to everybody's house who had one of these paintings and tell the story again? Uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of hard to figure out what was, what was going on there. There was in any case, uh, a dialogue about most of the paintings. And for a while, uh, I've spent many years teaching and then since, since I stopped teaching, uh, working for Amnesty International, which where I also have had the occasion to use these paintings to uh, uh, illustrate various things about uh, Central African politics. And the paintings were, it, were in the, in the hands of Fabian and his, his then wife for some of them for, for several years before the conversations. So, so Chibumba is, is sitting down in the end of 74 telling stories. Some of them are literally stories in the sense of fabulation, made up stuff and interpreting the paintings. And I'm looking wait, and saying, wait a minute, there's something funny. There's nothing like that in the painting that he is supposedly describing. And I realized, being it takes me a little while to get the point, uh, Chibumba kept working. After he painted the first one, uh, he did another one and another one and another one. And in some cases, it's very, it's very obvious. They're all, the paintings are almost identical, except uh, this one here, which is called Colony Belge, uh, shows a flogging at the morning uh, call the colors and starting of the the day in the uh, in the uh, Belgian camp in that town, and this one says La Police Territoire de Cambo. And if you're paying attention, you realize that he doesn't necessarily want to make lots of pictures that say Territoire de Cambo in them because most people in Congo and most visitors to, to Congo are not from Cambo. I didn't care because I wanted it as an illustration of colonial violence. Uh, but if you want, hey, suppose, suppose you're from Sakania. Well, I can make you one that says Sakania. You want, you want it to say Sakania on the side of the building? I'll, I'll do it. I can, I'll be back tomorrow with one for you. And so there's, there's dozens of these things, hundreds probably, uh, And they're, they're very, very similar, except they are tied down to a specific locality through the, uh, through the uh, label on the painting. Okay, now there's a, there, the, the, the next one illustrates a, a little bit different point, which also needs to be made, which is, for the most part, I was just sitting quietly at my house and Chibumba would come by and he would show me a couple of pictures and sometimes I would buy one and sometimes I'd buy more than one. But I had just recently had a conversation with Fabian, my neighbor, and I asked him about uh, a painting that he had on the wall of uh, Gogo Lutete. And he, Johannes was sort of not very, not very helpful in putting me in touch with the painter. So I, I, Machika, I think his name is, 
in any case, it doesn't matter. I didn't especially care about that, but I was doing research on uh, Batatella, Batatella revolts, and so on. And, and so when I saw uh, Chibumba the next time, I said, do you do uh, Gongo Lutete? And he said, well, yes, I can do you one. And he came back with one. And this one, you, you, you really have to, to take my word for it or check afterwards. Crawford has a painting also like this. Uh, Fabian has one in his book, of course, and probably a, a number of other people who, who collect this stuff have one, but they're, they're, there's an important difference. Mine says, Gongo Lutete Manger Dung. Well, you can hardly be more direct than that, can you? Uh, that was something was taught in the schools. Uh, Chibumba hadn't had very much schooling, but he had been probably to a Catholic mission school, and that's what they learned in school. And uh, Gongo, according to this story, it was was a, was literally a cannibal, and had. Uh, Chibum is a little bit unclear on, on what kind of a, of a cannibal he was, whether he was a cannibal that mostly ate the people he captured or he mostly sent them as slaves to East Africa, to the East, East African uh, slave trade. And he had a hard, kind of a hard, uh, a bit of difficulty with the question of how the slaves got from East Africa to Southern United States. But in any case, there was something about, about eating people and also about selling people uh, into the slave trade. Uh, my painting has nothing about the slave trade in it at all. I guess you can read these people in the background as somehow tied up and maybe they're going to be sent off to the slave trade. But Crawford's picture on the other hand has uh, Gongo sitting next to somebody who is an agent of the slave traders. Actually, uh, there's even a little bit of a duplication there. He seems to think, uh, Chibumba seems to think by the day he was making that painting that maybe Tipu Tip was, was the one who was getting the slaves and this other person was an agent of, of Tipu Tip. In any case, the detail is maybe not super important, but it, it does mean that my particular painting is uh, is unique. It has no direct reference to slave trade. I'm going to try to show you a couple of, of other famous uh, Chibumba pictures and say something about them. Uh, the top there shows Lumumba being arrested. Uh, there's, a, there's a series of about 12 or 15 paintings in, uh, in Fabian's book of the story of Lumumba and it's been reproduced in Lumumba d'Alizar and other books. Uh, it starts with a picture which I, I think is based on a literal, literal misunderstanding uh, of Lumumba being a, somehow an employee uh, sitting behind a desk at the, brewer, at the brewery. I think he was a beer salesman out going out to taverns and buying rounds of beer for people rather than a manager. But in any case, that's neither here nor there. The, the, crucial, the crucial paintings are these two. The top one is called Calvert d'Afrique. And it shows Lumumba arriving at the airport in, in Lubumbashi. Uh, he's in his singlet, he's been abused on the plane, and he's being intercepted by uh, or arrested by military. Now, this, this, this is kind of dangerous terrain for, uh, for a young painter to, to be getting into because the, the police who are arresting him, military police, are literally meant to be Katangan military police or the Katangan gendarmerie, and he's carefully put little copper crosses on their epaulets. But to look at the uniforms, anybody who was living in Lubumbashi in 74, 75, as I was, 
uh, would think that those are Mobutu's troops. In other words, the uniforms look very, very much like uh, Mobutu's army, and the painting could easily be interpreted to say uh, uh, Mobutu's troops uh, uh, killed, uh, arrested, and killed uh, uh, Lumumba. The, the The last one is even more more ambiguous and interesting. Uh, you'll need to. Um, uh, if, if you want to follow up on it, check check in the in the Fabian book because there's a several there's several interesting differences between this picture, which shows, according to this, the label on there, La Mort Historique de Lumumba un Polo e Oquito. Fabian has a painting very similar to this too. It has the stars, which represent the six original uh, provinces. Uh, in Fabian's picture, the wound on uh, Lumumba's side, which is meant to evoke the, evoke the, the wound on, uh, on Jesus' uh, body, uh, actually comes out and spill, spells the word, the blood actually spells the word inite. And the label on the painting is Bob Denar killed Lumumba. Well, by the Two years later, Fabian and, and um, Chibumba are having this conversation and uh, Chibumba says, well, actually I was wrong. I thought that Bob Denar killed Lumumba, but really it was the local politicians from, from Katanga who killed Lumumba. Uh, well, that, that's certainly gonna get you in tr trouble with a different set of people than the, the, the original version. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 my, I guess my point, I, I really need to wrap this up. My, my point is that there's been a great amount written about, about the mercenaries and their role in, uh, in Congo 60 to 65. And uh, even by me, uh, but but for for some pe ordinary people in Lubumbashi, they weren't aware of all of this stuff about the mercenaries being uh, Mad Mike from South Africa and uh, all of these Rhodesians and and South and what and Afrikaners and so forth coming in. It was Bob Denar, and if it wasn't Bob Denar, then it was uh, Scrum in in the uh, in uh, Kivu. Uh, in other words, the English speaking uh, mercenaries just don't exist in the mind of, uh, of Chibumbo. I, th I probably ought to stop there because I, as, you can, as you can imagine, I have nine different, nine more paintings that I could easily spend the next couple of hours telling you about them, but that's probably massive overkill. So why don't I stop? Thank you, Tom. Here in 1987, is that correct? No. Uh, another Crawford student. Um, his first book was on Namibia's post-apartheid re regional institutions. Uh, he's written on the lineages of state fragility, rural civil society in Guinea-Bissau, uh, also on subnationalism in Africa, and most recently, 2021, a book on a human right to local autonomy, a quest for local control. So, welcome. Okay, a shout out to Tim Longman for uh, in many ways setting up what I'm gonna talk about a little bit in, in, in broad terms. Um, 
Yeah. So the title of this talk is Crawford Young's Impact on My Understanding of Cultural Pluralism and Stateness. And this, the goal is to offer a sense of the impacts of the scholarly work and teaching of Crawford Young on my understanding of ethnic identity and ethnic activism as a concrete principle within the study of comparative politics. To do so, I will focus on some of the central conceptualist analytical points emphasized by Young, which helped to shape the way that I think about the nexus between local and national politics, as well as the link between ethnic identity and nation state behavior, before moving on to discuss how this may help us to understand the dynamics of current conflicts occurring in various parts of the world. First, Professor Young helped to more fully expose the malleable nature of ethnic consciousness, as we heard in great detail regarding the Congo by Tim, the unpredictability of cultural political change, the difficulty of scientizing ethnic activism and categorizing types of ethno-political mobilization, and the difficulty of predicting the level of intensity and the territorial reach of cultural politics. Secondly, no less significantly for Young was the need to explain contemporary political change and ethnic state interaction within their respective historical contexts and in appreciation of the particular configuration of state bureaucracies. But we also learn that historical context, while formative, is not necessarily determinative. The trajectory of cultural politics can change dramatically in a given situational instance, providing sufficient political instigation, elite maneuvering, and predatory state behavior. Thirdly, Young especially perceives the danger of privileging instrumentalist actors as part of the governing national bureaucracy. This is an insight that has been repeatedly borne out, often to tra tragic effects in many nations across the globe in recent decades. Permit me to elaborate on some of these points a bit more fully with particular respect to the study of A, ethnic identity, B, territorial politics, and C, nationalism. Briefly, all three. Uh, regarding ethnic identity. Throughout his career, Young emphasized the striking fluidity, clearly, of cultural and personal identities. He made clear that ethnic ties were simultaneously linked to broader regional and national identities, depending on situational circumstances, leadership impacts, economic opportunities, and changes in local, national, and continent-wide priorities, all of which frequently resulted in a liminal fluctuating self-identification process. This is something I thought a great deal about throughout the course of my field research in Guinea-Bissau, where, for example, people did not resist colonial rule on any consciously ethnic basis, but rather in defense of their local communities, as Tim pointed out with respect to the Congo, and in Guinea-Bissau, intermarriage among people from different localities was common and still is. It was during the settled colonial period, so-called, that identity formation assumed a more concretized pattern in reflection of manipulative state policies that were intended to reinforce the authority of the clientelistic repressive local bureaucracy. Identity formation took yet another iteration during the lengthy war of national liberation in Guinea-Bissau when people from throughout the countryside joined together in common struggle and began to see themselves as proto-citizens of the new nation in waiting, the active embrace of a shared language, Creolo, helped to further cement this newly ascendant unifying identity. At the same time, however, despite such changes in identity that attest to its liminal nature, instrumentalist leadership often generated a dangerous hardening of ethnic consciousness in Guinea-Bissau as elsewhere. What is particularly helpful here is a Jungian perspective on the study of ethno-political mobilization that is nuanced, layered, and multifactorial. One that acknowledges the potency of collective activism, but also emphasizes the importance of the in intervention of state-centered politicians and the economic policy interests of governmental agencies in the context of profoundly heterogeneous, culturally plural civil societies the distribution of power and resources would of necessity reflect elite efforts to secure their power through care carefully calibrated policy attention to both state interests and to so-called communal interests. 
Now, second, uh, second subject, B, <laughs> regarding territorial politics. Professor Young also recognized that studying ethnic mobilization provides a, an important window into the ways in which political activism becomes territorialized. For the past couple of decades, I have turned my attention toward an effort to better understand assertions of local autonomy in different parts of the world, focusing on local communities which actively seek to secure local control and to fend off the intervention of higher level authorities. This has required a global appreciation of grassroots actors engaged in efforts to strengthen their respective policy and organizational capacities, to better assure their control over land use, to engage in neighborhood specific participatory budgeting processes, to try to seriously bulk up at the grassroots what are otherwise typically half-hearted decentralization programs to campaign uh, to campaign against fracking, fracking and other affronts to local natural environments, and to mobilize social and legal networks in order to oppose various forms of macro-political centralism. In examining efforts to make progress toward achieving greater levels of local power, I have not lost sight of Young's emphasis on the importance of a multi-scalar perspective of the simultaneously, simultaneous intermixing of regional national and global influences on localities. Such a perspective has importantly shaped my effort to underline the multitudinous ways in which communities seek to pursue their respective relative autonomy within broader institutional and geospatial contexts. Next subject, <clears throat> C, regarding nationalism. Today, Global events make clear the relevance not only of various quests for local autonomy, but also the heightened relevance of ethnic politics and especially ethno-nationalism. In this regard, I will offer a few words regarding the current catastro catastrophic war taking place in Ukraine, a land to which, as it happens, I can trace part of my extended family lineage. It does not take special insight <clears throat> you're all very smart people, to emphasize and understand the extent to which the Russian megalomaniac Vladimir Putin has relied on an instrumentalist approach to autocratic rule and a violent, aggressive notion of ethno-nationalist Russophile expansionism. This has been coupled with an historically distorted narrative regarding the territory of Ukraine with devastating cons consequences. Putin has engaged in the rapid construction of a psychosocial foundation of Russian self-regard predicated on an expansive notion of ethno-territorial acquisition. I am aware that the politics of Russo irredentism and instrumentalist ethno-manipulation regarding Ukraine are exceedingly complex. Still, a Jungian analytic, analytic prism helps to provide the fundamentals of an explanatory overlay. Thus, it appears that Putin and his henchmen are attempting to instrumentally galvanize the Russian populace at the grassroots. Highly orchestrated Soviet-style cultural gatherings are held in stadiums in order to spread the good feeling, however artificially contrived, of shared Russian ethnic and national traditions. Military conscription, conscription was activated in February of this year, just a few weeks ago for reserve soldiers and sailors up to age 45 and for ex-officers up through age 55 on the pretext of a heightened need to defend the homeland against imminent Western intervention. Here, the very preservation of Russian ethnic collectivity becomes the basis for a purportedly defensive military mobilization. At the same time, however, Putin tells us that the defense of the Russian homeland extends through Ukrainian territory as Russian cultural identity includes the inhabitants of Ukraine. Putin claims in speeches delivered in 2021 and in a document he wrote titled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians that Ukraine is where the, the Russian people actually originate from. So apparently those who today them call themselves Ukrainians are interlopers who do not have a truly separate or independent identity since their claim to cultural distinctiveness is based on an artificial construction 
of Ukrainian identity, says Putin, that was cultivated initially several, several hundred years ago by the Polish elite and is encouraged today by the West. And so, Putin reasons, this pretension to separateness essentially means that so-called Ukrainians are in effect trespassing in Kyiv and throughout Ukrainian territory. But Putin also claims that Ukrainians are actually Russians who are falsely pretending to be a Ukrainian other. So apparently they need to be forcibly re-educated as to their Slavic brotherhood and politically and militarily reconnected to their big Russian blood relatives. In truth, prior to Putin's aggressions, prior to what has happened, Ukrainians shared a dual identity. That is to say, a distinctive cult Ukrainian cultural and linguistic heritage, an independent Ukrainian history, and a steady period of nation building over the past century and a half. But prior to that, back in the 10th to 11th centuries, it is true that they were ruled over by a common Russian polity known as the Kievan Rus. As a, as a result, Ukrainians still share substantial cultural attributes with Russians, even as they primarily identify with their own distinctive culture and celebrate their nationalist impulse, which steadily developed through the 19th and 20th centuries. Ukrainians did not appear to perceive any particular incongruity between their own sense of cultural belonging and their simultaneous sharing of numerous Russian cultural characteristics. But Putin does not wish to admit to such cross-cultural cross affinities. For him, there is no distinctive Ukrainian identity, but only a Russian one in Ukraine. How exactly this justifies the mass murder of people who are claimed to be also Russian is left mysteriously unanswered. They apparently need to be evicted, eliminated, or tyrannized into submission, with the real Russians then reclaiming their rightful control over Ukrainian land. At that point, the people who self-identify as Ukrainian, but who are actually Slavic descendants of Russians, according to Putin, can be reabsorbed back into Russia, which would then extend through the territory of what is today Ukraine. <clears throat> What Putin should do is turn to page 26 of the politics of cultural pluralism and read this passage where Crawford Young writes that, quote, even the most downtrodden nationality of all, the Ukrainians, <laughs> divided between Austria, Hungary, Poland, and Russia, achieved national self-awareness. This was the case even though Russian political and cultural leaders frequently claimed throughout the 19th century that there was no such thing as, you, as a Ukrainian national identity. <clears throat> Indeed, according to the Russian historian Serhei Plokhi, this claim regarding the lack of Ukrainian identity does indeed hark back to at least the 17th century when the narrative of a Russian Kyiv in perpetuity was actively promoted by the Kyiv Orthodox clergy based in Ukraine who wanted protection of the Russian Tsar. It evolved into what became a way for Russians to distinguish themselves as a unique and purportedly superior people, the ultimate Slav kingdom standing in charge of a broader Slavic nation that includes the Ukrainians who are somehow who somehow are part of that broader Slav nation, but in an inferior, dominated, and dependent position. This, according to Plochy, represents an idealized Russo-ethnogenesis that has at least in part shaped Russian cultural consciousness as well as Russian foreign policy decision-making for centuries. Putin's contemporary analysis is clearly consistent with, and in many respects is a revival of, the attitudes toward Ukraine held by the czarist Russian intelligentsia. It represents a classic ethno-nationalist chauvinistic narrative. It is similar in at least a broad contour to the case of Han Chinese imperialism, which has now led to the territorial displacement and cultural disenfranchisement of ethnic minorities in Western China, such as the Uyghur, one million of whom, as I'm sure most of you know, have now been placed in internment camps within Xinjiang, region. 
Han Chinese are increasingly settling on Uyghur lands to assure the predatory central state's domination over Xinjiang territory and the exploitation of the region's natural and economic resources. Just as the Russian state aims to legitimize its forcible subjugation of, the, of Ukraine by denying that Ukrainians have a separate identity and asserting that they are part of the broader Slavic family of Russians, the Chinese government has made a point of claiming, beginning with the Cultural Revolution, that Uyghurs are actually members of the broader Chinese family and that Xinjiang region has been part of China since ancient times. So then in these cases, denial of the very existence of ethnic identity converges with efforts at ethnic delegitimation, de in turn creating a platform from which to launch waves of repression aimed at forcible inclusion into the dominant ethnic group, but always as subordinate at, and repressed subjects. We find a similar process with the systematic cultural and political discrimination against Muslims in the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir and the exploitation of mineral resources there by companies contracted by India's central government. Uh, sim similarly, the campaigns of mass violence against the Rohingya and other ethnic minorities carried out by the ruling military junta of Myanmar, along with the exploitation of natural resources by the armed forces in minority dominated rural regions of Myanmar. Parallels can also be drawn with the brutal war against the Tigray and Afar peoples of Ethiopia. There are people in this room who know more about that than I do. Being prosecuted by President Abi Ahmed and with the orchestration of persistent waves of mass violence carried out still today by militia loyal to the Sudanese central government against minority groups in Darfur. In all of these cases, autocratic leaders perceive the strength of their predatory state to be most fully manifested by and enhanced by repression against ethnic minorities, the seizure of their territories, and the capturing of their economic and natural resources for use by regime-affiliated oligarchs. In Russia, a zero-sum war against the ethnic other in part aims to bolster the symbolic imagery of and base of support for the person who historian Tim Snyder refers to as the oligarch in chief, while also providing a populist excuse to plunder the wealth and natural resources of Ukraine, specifically in order to fortify Moscow's rentier government bureaucracy. To do so, truth and fact-based history are exchanged for a falsified and distorted narrative that proclaims the superiority of the national state and majority culture over and above that of the purportedly inferior and dangerous ethnic minority. The interests of the predatory state are furthered by the promotion of, a, of an ethno-nationalist narrative that is shorn of historical precision State interests are served by the aggressions, hegemonic and ethno-expansionist policies of the personal ruler and his oligarchic entourage. This is the case not only in the above mentioned cases, but also in contemporary South Sudan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Thailand, and elsewhere. State predation, distorted ethnic narratives, and kleptocratic personalism converge in ways that Professor Young would have recognized as all too familiar, echoing similar processes that had been occurring in previous decades in the Congo, Uganda, and elsewhere. The post-Soviet end of history, it seems, has today given way to an all too familiar return to the past, a not so new history, indeed, one with colonial refrains, in which Bula Matari predatory state building and the construction of ethnocentric hierarchies represent the essential mechanisms of 21st century power politics. Thank you. Our last uh, panelist is Cedric Jourd, who is, was also Crawford's last student. Um, he came, he got his PhD in 2002. Um, he came here um, giving up an illustrious acting career in uh, Quebec. He was uh, in, a, in a very famous uh, <laughs> popular, <laughs> popular um, 
uh, children's film in, in 1984, La Guerre de Tuc, which is the, you know, the, the, the war of the, what are these? Woolen, woolen hats, yeah. And, but, and so he came here um, and, and uh, uh, studied and, and worked on Mauritania and, the, and worked on the spectacle in Mauritania, uh, the politics of the spectacle. Um, he's uh, continued to write many, many articles on uh, Islam and politics, um, identity issues, uh, he worked on the Islamic movements in the Sahel, uh, and worked on in Senegal, Mali, and continued with Mauritania as well. Uh, now he's a professor at the University of Ottawa, so welcome. <laughs> hmm, I did not expect that. Oof. All right, it's okay. The dog who stopped the war, it's the name in English the movie. All right, starting the timer. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am e, Scott and uh, Michael in the African Studies program. Also uh, Ramadan Mubarak for those of you here or on Zoom who will soon start this holy month. Um, I read a little, um, the first email that I found that I wrote um, to Crawford when I went to Mauritania in January of 1999. Uh, and I read that during last week, last year's event when, when we were on Zoom talking about Crawford. And I just wanted to repeat it here because not everybody was on, on this Zoom event. And I was telling Crawford, in, and it took about 30 minutes to, you know, send an email, receive an email back in 1999, Mauritania. And I was telling um, Crawford how hot it was in Mauritania for a Quebec guy who did his PhD in Wisconsin. <laughs> and he, uh, he replied that... Uh, so, and it, yeah, it took about 20 minutes to, to unload this email. And he said, in your spare time, you might identify some, identify some vacant sand dunes in the vicinity on which you can take an option. Think of the fortune to be made selling Nouakchott vacation property in Quebec. <laughs> so I thought it was, yeah, that was a great advice. So, all right. Um, okay, so uh, 20 years ago, almost day to day, I mean, uh, it was in May 2002. I was on a train from Montreal to Chicago. I hate flying. And I was uh, uh, preparing my defense. I was defending uh, 20 years ago uh, in May. And uh, at the time, the train went from Montreal all the way to Chicago. Um, I was on the same train two days ago. I still hate flying. Uh, the train stops at Windsor, doesn't continue. So I had to rent a car and then drive for eight hours. But as I was on that train, Montreal to Windsor, it was the occasion to read back my dissertation and, um, and think about uh, Crawford's influence on my work and also to kind of think about how things have changed or did not change in this borderland uh, uh, of uh, Mauritania and Senegal, so the Senegal River Valley, where the uh, main community are the Halpular or the Fulani, if you want. Um, and so I'm going to think about that in terms of, you know, with the perspective of the long durée uh, that Crawford really liked. Um, I just want to say also, I was talking to Melinda this morning, and, and we realized that we were nervous as we were preparing, preparing this, uh, this presentation. And, you know, we've been teaching for 20 years, so why are we nervous? And we realized that because we're back in the place where we were grad students, my committee Michael is here, Ailey is here, Ustaz Kawal is here, and in the back I have the master who's looking at me on the two sides, and so it's hard not to feel that I'm, you know, 20, I don't know, 7, 28, and that it's one of my first presentations, so I'm going to read it, uh, even though usually when I teach I need no notes and no computer and no nothing, but anyway. All right, so... Um, in my dissertation, I looked at the, the interplay between ethnic politics and social status in the south of Mauritania, so the Senegal River Valley. Um, and I looked at the construction of the authoritarian uh, state in Mauritania, um, which was based basically on two dynamics of exclusion, among others, but I looked at two. Uh, one that involved ethnicity and the other one that in involved uh, social status or, um, or caste, uh, as, as we sometimes uh, use that term. So this was really a, a very Crawford-esque uh, project to some extent, or you could you know, feel this influence, state construction, ethnicity. 
But of course, in light of what uh, Michael said yesterday when you were talking about your uh, discussions with, with Crawford when you wanted to argue that there, is, there, are, there were social classes in the Congo, um, the, I, was, I was looking at social status, social classes or caste in Mauritania. So hence, this, this, there is this kind of Schatzberg-esque as well influence on the, on the work. Uh, uh, that I was uh, that was doing I was doing so it's an interesting combination of uh, these uh, these influences. Um, so a concept that I that I used to in the dissertation actually came from Linda Beck, who was a student of Crawford. Uh, uh, she I arrived in 1995. She left in 1996. And in her uh, amazing dissertation on on Senegal, um, she was talking about the concept of Demba Prasi. Um, a, a portmanteau word, of course, and so Demba is um, the third, it's, it's, it's the name of the third son uh, amongst Fulani communities, uh, and it basically means somebody of no importance. When you're the third son, you cannot aspire to anything, you're not the eldest, not even the second, so it's basi it basically means the, the average guy who uh, certainly cannot expect anything, cannot be invited around the table of those who make uh, uh, decisions. And of course, there's also a gender dimension. It's, it's a boy's name uh, in, in, uh, in this case. And, um, and Linda was re referring to Dembakrasi because a, a Senegalese sociologist used a term um, that was, was discussed by Senegalese politicians in reaction to the elected uh, assemblies and that were created by the French at, you know, in the 19th 1940s, 1950s, and they despised Dembakrasi because it, it, it meant that people who normally would not play a political role could suddenly, through elections, uh, eventually pretend to play a political role. Um, and I looked at Dembakrasi in Senegal, in, in, in Mauritania, sorry, in, in two ways. Um, one was about the ethnic side of Dembakrasi, and the other one was the social status side of Dembakrasi. Um, so let me say briefly, like discuss these two aspects. Ethnicity first. So in the dissertation, I look at debates about ethnicity since the 1950s, more or less at the time when people knew or were expecting that this polity, this colonial territory could eventually become an in independent state. Um, and um, I was looking and doing interviews and I, I looked at the archives and looking at the discussions that they had at the time, and it was clear that um, as, as political actors were debating the future of this new state that was to become, um, the country would be dominated by people of Moorish or, or Bidan origin, Arabic speaking people, and that the, the ethnic minorities, mostly the Halkular or the Fulani, uh, would be the Dembas of, of this state that is not really invited at the table. Um, at the time, Halkularen and other people of the southern part of the country created an association to defend the interest of Halkularen, and they were debating three options. One would, was the status quo, that is, there would be this international border separating the river, the Senegal River, uh, and one part would go to Mauritania, the other would become uh, Senegal, so nothing would change from the colonial time. Another option would be to, for the entire valley to join Senegal, so they would detach the northern bank of the river and include it in Senegal. And the third option was actually to create an independent state of the Senegal River Valley, Futa Toro, uh, on the basis of a theocratic republic that had been created in the, 19, uh, in the um, 18th and 19th century. Of course, in the end, as Crawford explains in his book very well, uh, uh, Uti Posiditis uh, uh, prevailed, and basically the boundaries drawn by the colonial powers remained. So basically, the Senegal River Valley became the international border, separating communities Halkular communities on the northern and southern bank, and they both belong to two separate states. So unfortunately for Halkular, and nothing really changed. Uh, as Mauritania became independent, it was clear as more as decades were uh, passing that it would be the country mostly of the Moors, the Mauritanie, le pays des Morts, uh, and that uh, uh, Halkular and, and non-Arabic speaking communities would be basically second class citizens. Um, and that became clearer and clearer every year. Uh, uh, erupting, of course, with the eruption of the violence in 1989-1991, when hundreds of Halkularen were killed, uh, about 100,000 of them were, ex were expelled uh, to Senegal, even though they were Mauritanian. And 
I arrived there in uh, 1999 and you could still feel uh, the tension and the violence when you were traveling in, in Futatoro in the Senegal River Valley. Uh, the, the police apparatus was, was very present and, and quite harsh. Since then, over the last 20 years, nothing has really changed in the country. Uh, all key positions in the state apparatus are dominated by, uh, by Moors uh, from the presidency, uh, interior ministry, justice, defense, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you do see, of course, some Halkular and you know, Black African politicians here and there, but. Clearly not, not at that you know, first difference. And Halpularen on the Senegalese side of the border never really felt ex uh, excluded or oppressed. Uh, they were part of the construction of the Senegalese state without any uh, problem. So Dembacrasi did not have this kind of ethnic dimension that you saw in Mauritania. Although in 2012, uh, when Macky Sall was uh, the current president of Senegal was elected, um, I was in Dakar at the time, and it was the first time that a non that, that a president who's for, for whom Wolof was not the first language was elected. So he's a Hal Pular, his first language is Pular. And, um, and you had suddenly discussions in the street and you know, in, in, in living rooms and uh, on, in, on social media about the fact that it's, it's, it's you know, maybe the Pular lobby is going to take control over the state. And why is it that a president can make speeches in Pular and not in Wolof? And suddenly the ethnic dimension, which you did not really hear about in Senegal, uh, became more and more important. And as we see this kind of backlash against Fulani communities in Mali, in, in Burkina Faso, in Niger, uh, one wonders if this kind of discourse may not uh, crystallize in Senegal. Maybe not, we'll see how it will happen, but, uh, but in any case, certainly we don't see the same kind of inequalities and tensions that you saw, that we saw in, in, uh, in Mauritania. Now, that's about democracy and ethnic differences or ethnic oppression in one country and relative, you know, uh, uh, equality in, in the other in, in the other country. But as Crawford said, and I'm quoting uh, uh, his his uh, one sentence from his book, um, uh, ethnic consciousness is multi-layered, as we know, of course. And we have there there are of course important debates taking place within ethnic communities, right? Just like what John Lonsdale was talking about, the moral ethnicity debates about who has the right to be. Uh, uh, to occupy a position of power, of political power, religious power, social power, distribution of resources within ethnic communities. And those debates within the Halpular community uh, uh, are extremely important. And they also shaped to, to some extent the construction of, of the state uh, in both uh, Mauritania and, um, and Senegal. And so something I did not mention until now, which is important is that the Halpular community just like may, may, many neighboring communities, the Wolof, the Soninke, uh, the Tuareg, um, uh, the Moors, uh, they're, they're structured along a very hierarchical uh, 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 social structure with the quote unquote noble clans at the top, the artisans in the middle and the former slaves or freed slaves at the very bottom of this pyramid. And power, economic power, political power, uh, social power, religious power is still to some extent distributed according to this kind of, of, of pyramid. And when I was studying Mauritanian, uh, well, Halpular politics in the 1950s, you did not hear or could not see much traces about this caste system uh, back, in, yeah, back in the 1950s, mostly because all the relevant political actors were from noble, uh, noble families, noble lineages, except one event, this organization I mentioned that was created in the 1950s to defend the, the interests of the Hapularen, they wanted to elect a president in, I think it was 1948. And one guy ran for the presidency and he was, he was very popular, but was eventually asked to step aside. And the reason was because he was of a, an artisan background. He was not a noble. Uh, and so it was, it was clear for those who interviewed that somebody who is not noble cannot be the leader of an association that represents Hal Pular. Um, now, the notion of caste or social status eventually uh, has, has arisen and has uh, uh, become an important issue nowadays uh, in both Senegal and, uh, and, and Mauritania. And I just want to take the two minutes that I have left to, to discuss some of these changes. So how these internal dynamics within the Hal Pular society are changing and maybe the Dembas 
that is those who cannot aspire, could not aspire to a political role are perhaps rising. You see this first in terms of elections at the municipal level. So something that was unthinkable uh, in you know, 20, 30 years before, you see now mayors of former slave status being elected. Um, so there are many cases in Senegal, a few cases in Mauritania. I was actually in Mauritania when one man was elected, who, he was a, of a blacksmith background, and this created a major clash. But anyway, he was able to, to be elected for, for one term. And now you see a couple of towns on the Senegalese side of the river uh, uh, who have been elected despite being former slaves or, or, or people of the, uh, with the artisan status. The other change is taking place at the religious level. Um, until recently, you could not be an imam or a qadi, or you could not aspire to play any religious role if you were not of a noble from a noble family. But things are changing. And as you know, this is a region where Sufi brotherhoods are extremely important. Um, and there is one Sufi, the, probably the most dynamic Sufi brotherhood in the region uh, is, is led by a family and by a movement that clearly claim to be all inclusive. And I've, I did many interviews with young Hankularan uh, who really joined that Sufi branch because of this really kind of equal, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the importance of equality. It's also, by the way, in terms of gender, it's also a, a, a movement that has many female muqaddama, uh, which are religious leaders who can spiritually guide men and women, uh, who have uh, religious um, ceremonies that gather men and women around circle. So it's very, uh, very unusual. And it's probably the most dynamic of the Sufi, uh, Sufi branches that you see in this, in this region. And the other, uh, within the religious sphere, uh, the, uh, the other changes that may be happening is with Islamist parties. So in Mauritania, the main opposition party is an Islamist party, and they understood very well the, the problems with this social hierarchy, and they played on that uh, basically claiming that unlike the Sufi, like the old Sufi brotherhoods, they can, they, they are really applying the all equal before God uh, idea. Now, it seems to be working in Mauritania. In Senegal, I did interviews with senior Halkular Islamist leaders, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that this is really happening. And just a last anecdote on that, I was interviewing five of these uh, old men and they were telling me how we're all equal and caste has no nothing to do with religion, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end I said, but but it's interesting because you know I you're you're all noble. So where are the former slaves and the artisans? And and then they were laughing, and one actually said laughingly that look, if, if you are if you are of the Machudo, the slave uh, um, caste group, uh, you cannot speak at a, at, a, at a meeting like this. You cannot speak uh, at any of our meetings. So basically telling me that the reality might differ from, from, from what they're you know, claiming. And so it's not, it's not very clear to what extent we see that, that these Islamist movements will be able to surpass uh, the social status and would, would allow the Dembas to actually become Imam and, and leaders of those Islamist movements. So ethnicity, intra-ethnic discussions, and, and the role of those Dembas, uh, that's uh, something that I was thinking about uh, on my train as I was traveling towards Madison. And I'll stop here. Thank you. So could we ask our um, panelists to come and sit up front here? And if we have um, uh, questions for uh, Thomas Turner, you can ask them, but he won't be able to answer them. It won't be like an interactive thing. So it'll be at the end, then he, he can, we can then have him bring him back on through Zoom. So there's, there's some problem with techn technological problem, unbeknownst, I don't know what it, exactly it is, but uh, all right. So any questions? Yes, Scott. That was such a great panel. Thank you all. I learned a ton and they were great presentations. Um, I want to ask a question looking forward to the possibility of, of doing a volume out of the proceedings. And the question is, what you think of as the Jungian, I think to quote Josh, the Jungian, um, the Jungian way of thinking about ethnicity. And, and I mean, when I was listening to you, Tim, I was thinking a lot about sort of Dan Posner's work and Robert Bates's work and wondering, wondering how you would distinguish, how you would distinguish a sort of Jungian approach to 
to ethnic construction and history and instrumentalism compared to some of the, um, I think, more rationalist orient sort of, and in some ways more dominant in, in contemporary political science approaches. Um, so I just, I just pose that to anyone who would want to answer that question. If, I'm sure you guys have thought about it in your own work. Um, and then Tom, at the end, I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit about what your critique was of Fabian. I, I, it escaped me at the end and uh, whether or not it was that in, in, at the end of the day, Chibumba, Chibumba was a, a more malleable, I mean, he was sort of, he would adopt whatever history the person in front of him wanted to hear as opposed to Fabian who saw him much more as a kind of um, an ethno history. And so I just wanted to hear, hear, hear more if you have time. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, first of all, uh, congratulations to everybody for excellent presentations. I learned a lot. Uh, I have two que one question and one comment. One question for Dawuda, one comment for Tim. Um, Dawuda, your presentation was very informative, uh, but you focused mostly on the North and the whole question of uh, religious uh, factor. But I remember, you know, having lived in Nigeria twice and went there several times for meetings. And I was a keynote speaker at the conference of the Center for Development uh, uh, for um, in uh, Abuja in February of 2011. And uh, what was the uh, topic was indigeneity and uh, um, ethnic uh, uh, exclusion in, in Nigeria. Uh, what about if, uh, ingenuity? Is it a, a factor? Uh, what makes it a factor in terms of uh, um, problems of uh, ethnic conflict and uh, wars and so on and so forth? And Tim, first, uh, uh, congratulations on uh, the excellent summary you gave us of, of uh, uh, ethnicity in the Congo. Um, I think that um, the... Um, Crawford Young's uh, political pluralism does have certain areas which we certainly need to be improved. Uh, one, one point which I disagreed with him was uh, the impression he gave that uh, somehow it is preferable to have uh, smaller ethnic groups running the country rather than big ones. <laughs> and, and even mentioned that uh, Luba Kasai, a group for which I belong, and the Bakongo, we're, we're not supposed to run the Congo. They should not be running the Congo. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I disagreed with that point. And I think that uh, uh, Kasavubu was a Mukong. He didn't, he, Kasavubu was a, was a, a, fig, a figurehead president, not a, who had the constitutional, I mean, uh, parliamentary democracy. So Kasavubu did not have uh, really real power, but he was uh, very much liked by the Congolese people. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, the current president, uh, Chisekedi, is a Luba Kasai, and he too is, is, has a quite, uh, you know, a good ranking. I mean, all of the, the latest, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, ele I mean, latest so so uh, sondage in English, in English uh, huh? survey. the latest survey, <laughs> uh, it was a bit uh, lower than the, the earlier ones, but I think that... Uh, one cannot exclude any ethnic group in terms of running the country. And the question of uh, local factor, you're right. Local factors do have an, a, a role to play. But in most cases, there have been two things. One, the external influence. And second, economic issues. And economic issues you see it all over the world. Uh, in, in South Africa, uh, Africans from north of Limpopo are, are being, uh, you know, uh, are being killed uh, because South Africans say that they come here and take our jobs uh, and so on. So it's a factor. Uh, and in terms of external factor, we saw what happened in, in Kasai uh, in, in, in Katanga in 1960 was basically engineered from outside. Uh, Luba Kasai and Lulua are the same people. When the first Europeans came to the Kasai in the 1880s, when they asked the Lulua who, who they were, what did they say? We are Luba, who came from the South. 50 years later, we're fighting each other. The Belgians engineered this with a Catholic church to divide the people 
so that they could weaken the, the, the struggle for independence. Same thing in Katanga. The Lubakasai went there to work in the mines and on the railroad, and yet, uh, because they got a better economic situation, the, the Belgians tried to make us uh, enemies of the Luba Katanga and the other ethnic groups of Katanga. So these are factors which should be taken into account. That's maybe there's so much there. That I'm not going to remember. Um, thank, thanks for thanks for uh, all those. Um, uh, on the last point, George, uh, to his credit, Crawford Young does lay that out. I mean, he basically says that the Luba are one people that have been divided politically. Um, um, but um, thanks for the observation, so, uh, Scott. So the, I would have answered your question differently before I went back and reread all of Crawford's stuff which is I was thinking from his later works backward, uh, where his, with, with his focus on the state. And, and, I, and I, my memory of his earlier works had been colored by his emphasis on state formation and thinking that he really emphasized um, the state. And what I realized that he actually emphasizes the role of elites in the political arena. Um, and so his idea of instrumentalism is the way in which elites um, manipulate identities. Um, he does not have a lot of room for agency from below in that. Um, and so I think that is quite different from either a primarily economic element, although that's in there. I mean, he talks about economic deprivation, but it's, it's ideas of economic deprivation as manipulated by elites. Um, and, uh, and there's certainly not a lot of sort of rational actor uh, uh, idea there, for, for particularly particularly among the grassroots. Um, so I, I do think his perspective, and I think he he admits that in his later work. So so in in the volume that, that Gina is in, which I mean, he did two of these NEH seminars on identity politics. Um, and the second one was the that produced this book. And actually I ended, up, I ended up at Wisconsin because my undergraduate advisor at the obscure college that I went to in Oklahoma had come here and she said, you should go to Wisconsin. Crawford is a really nice guy. I knew nothing about what he worked on. I knew nothing about the school. I took her advice and ended up here, um, uh, and they're cursing it ever since. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I think that's kind of his distinctive thing, and I think I think he would be self-critical of that now. I mean, he acknowledged that thinking had moved on; he, he acknowledged it, but then he was he was on to different topics by then. So I think he's right at some level, and I don't think now that we do have this sort of emphasis on on sort of rational actors. Uh, the, the conference that we were at in Paris a couple of years ago, you know, the critique that the Anglophone group got from the French was we, we didn't deal sufficiently with the irrational parts of, of the genocide in Rwanda, that, that basically there was a brutality that just doesn't make sense, you know, and so I, I, I don't know, I, I think I still think of his contributions as as really important in terms of that sort of flexibility of identity. But I think there's also some limits to flexibility and there's also some element you can't quite explain about why people are willing to, to fight and kill over these identities that are come and go so quickly. Um, I don't know, I can't comment on George because you're just too brilliant on these things. And, and you know, I always mention George as, as the person who like went back to help run the electoral commission and then realized it was bogus and so resigned out of principle. So it's like, this is, you're too principled to argue with, so. Yeah, um, I think George, you are, uh, you're, you're quite right that um, that in the, in the Nigerian context, part of the, 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 the nature of, of identity conflicts um, can be seen from, from the perspective of uh, indigeneity. In other words, that some groups would see themselves as being natives, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they belong to a particular territory and so perceive others as outsiders, uh, are the native settler type of, uh, type of uh, uh, identity conflicts that uh, are very prevalent in, in different parts of uh, the African continent, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Eastern DR Congo, et cetera, that, that, that most of your work touches on. 
and, and several others in this room that have, have done that type of work. In, in the Northern Nigerian context, there is that aspect, particularly in the Middle Belt, um, and specifically on the plateau in Jos area, where you have Christian minority groups that have not been Islamized, that see themselves as being natives of plateau, okay? That they have been there earlier than everybody else. And so you, you find that playing out uh, between those groups, particularly on the plateau and other parts of the, uh, uh, other parts of the middle belt. Uh, but in the far north, it seems to me that the, 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 the idea of internal sectarianism within Islam in the northern Nigerian setting is the major driver of violence, uh, particularly the type that, that we have seen in the last one decade plus uh, with, with Boko Haram in, in Northeastern Nigeria. Uh, some observers of that phenomena tend to bring in the framework of Kanuri versus other groups. But I don't think that framework helps us to understand uh, what has been going on. It seems to me that one will have to see how within 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 the, the Islamic religious marketplace, Usman Kani talks about that, how the various sects, you know, keep replicating and, and, and the factionalism that goes on, you know, factions and, and critique of, of, of the others. But at the end of it, it also has to do with the issue of power and resources. You know, uh, you, you mentioned a very important, uh, important variable that we have to take on board these local factors. And, and, I, and I believe that that's very important. And that is where the, the legacy of Crawford comes in. You know, research that is based on a, a, a place, you know, we need to go to the place, we need to engage in interviews, we need to uh, 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 really study uh, uh, very closely uh, what is going on to be able to understand the agency, uh, uh, as, as you are saying uh, uh, earlier on, uh, and how these all will help us to understand these, uh, uh, these, uh, these, these issues. But, but you're quite correct. Uh, indigeneity is, uh, uh, is, uh, is a factor. Uh, Joshua? Okay, um, Scott had asked about my interpretation of a Jungian uh, perspective, right? Okay, so um, it's an interesting question uh, because it's a complicated answer. Uh, I think that uh, in many respects, certainly Crawford Young put cultural pluralism on the map within the study of comparative politics. On the other hand, in dissecting what do you mean by a Jungian approach to cultural pluralism? Um, what comes to my mind is anti-theoretical approach. Because if you were going to say that, but Professor Young, aren't you really advocating a constructivism here? Because you have so many different factors. He'd say, well, no, there's this bottom approach, you have to understand what's going on in the minds of the psycho, the psychological aspect. Uh, so then you're a primordialist. Well, no, that you have to understand the leaders and the elites and, and the machinations of, of state predation and how that impacts. So, uh, so you can go through all the various particular categories and, and he would deny that he's a particular, so his, he's a contextualist. Ultimately, this is a contextual approach. It's what it comes down to. But you have to know the specifics in each locality, and that changes over time within each locality. 
You have to be attentive to change, localism, particular factors, the details. And I think for that reason, he was so well respected with, by historians. Jan von Sina, Steve Friedman, men, firemen, I mean, uh, so many others. Uh, he, he was as, as respected within the field of history as political science. And I think that's because he's based on facts, the study of history, contextualism. Uh, so that, that's how I see it. And always attentive to the broader picture. As much as you have to study the, the facts on the ground, attentive to the multitudinous relationships among different levels of the polity local, regional, national, et cetera. So. I can't add anything to that. <laughs> Just one anecdote. First job talk, McGill University, and a member of the search committee who is about to do the interview says, oh, so you're a student of Crawford Young. Yeah, well, you know, Crawford Young and James Scott, they were good, but uh, they're outdated now. And, you know, identity politics is all about, you know, formal models and, uh, quantitative uh, you know, stuff. And I thought, well, the interview didn't go well, but <laughs> I knew I didn't agree with him, but yeah, so I share what you just said. Yeah. Hi, thank you. My name is Marin Larson. I'm at the University of Basel in Switzerland, but I'm an alumni of the bachelor's program uh, in African studies and in political science here at Wisconsin. Uh, so I just want to thank the organizers for having an event where I have a nice reason to come home. Um, my question is for Tim Longman. Um, Tim, I wanted to, my question has two sides. The first side is a simple ask if you can elaborate on your reading um, of Young's furtherance of the idea of urbanization interacting with the, the politics of identity in the DRC. Um, the second is kind of a question I want to forward you that I've received. Um, I received from a high up in the MINUSCO civilian leadership. Um, and that was very linked to, I think, some of the concerns that you and Young have in your scholarship. And that is the role of urbanization on such a culturally, ethnically plural society. Um, does that uh, urbanization hold more promise to politically divide further along those fault lines? Or as I think Manusco and many peace builders would love to naively hope, um, if that rapid urbanization, I'm thinking particularly in the East, holds any promise for uh, more peaceful cohabitation? Thank you. I have a, a question and an observation, and I want to go back to something Tim said. Um, he couldn't understand, in some cases, the rawness of the violence in Rwanda, that it seemed out of proportion and unnecessary. And I also want to go back to something Cedric said about uh, talking to some of the um, upper caste individuals. and. Well, where were the lower caste people? Uh, and I suspect the missing link here in, 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 in both observations is that political science has always been, I think, singularly inadept at dealing with emotion. And I, I think this is a, a major problem that the discipline has always faced and probably will continue to face given the direction in which things are, are moving. Um, I think there needs to be a reassessment of emotion, not necessarily in a psychological sense, but we need to interview people and talk to people about their emotions and about how their emotions come into, into play in politics. I think of uh, Bogomil Yasevsky's work interviewing school children and asking them about their dreams. I think we need to be doing a lot more of that kind of work. Since everyone's asking questions to Tim, I'll ask mine as well. Um, so <laughs> the last point that you made, you were um, 
talking about how Rwanda banned ethnic identity and then it ended up solidifying it, um, identities and that didn't happen in Burundi. Um, Tanzania is another case where after independence Nyerere banned um, the tribal unions. You couldn't mention um, ethnicity or religion in the context of individual people in the newspapers. Um, the census didn't get, you know, categorize people along ethnic lines. Uh, and so, and, but there it had a, a different, very different outcome. And in fact, the country became much more unified. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, first on urbanization, I mean, um, so Crawford Young's point in just rereading this over the, <laughs> the past week, um, you know, it, it is that it was really in this, it, in the context of coming together in places where there are both people who are kind of like you and people who are pretty much not like you, that you become much more aware of who you are. Uh, um, and uh, there's a lot to that. I've always kind of used that example that, that um, <clears throat> when I was uh, in going to high school in Kansas, our arch rival was, was Newton, Kansas. I was from El Dorado. But when I came to Wisconsin, the wife of one of my, our classmates was from Newton. And was like, wow, you're from Southwest Kansas. So cool, we're the same people, you know? <laughs> Um, right. So, but one of the things that he does suggest that, 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 uh, he makes it very clear that urbanization does not necessarily lead to conflict. Um, one of the cases that he mentions is Kinshasa, where you had these two main groups, the, the Bangala, who are not actually a people as points out, but the Bangala, um, and the Bakongo, um, who both had a sense that they both had some power and it didn't, didn't really result in violence. And there has not particularly been conflict between those groups. And, and what he, the suggestion is that, that, you know, you've got, it depends on the particular dynamics of that local urban setting and whether there is some competition. And um, a lot of it relies upon the way that leaders act. Do they really give people a sense that they are downtrodden and have to fight the others? I mean, this is my, my work on, on comparative genocide, you know, emphasizes a lot the degree to which uh, one of the things that's become clear to me is genocide is always done in the name of self-defense. Um, people always, always make the claim that um, they have to, let's say, invade Ukraine in order to protect the Russian minority who's being persecuted there, even if they're not. There are always this, this perception of things. And so it depends a lot on how things get framed by the leaders. And I, I think Crawford's right on that. Uh, I mean, I do think there, there's an emphasis in which, you know, so, so getting the right leaders and helping to um, stop people who want to, to stir up the pot. Uh, so I don't know how you do that because obviously we're not succeeding very well in the US either um, on that. Um, yeah, I, M Michael, I like the idea a lot. I, 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 I do think what's missing for me from the way that political science has moved is people. Um, we have gotten so far away from actually talking to people in their real lives and thinking about them as complex individuals. Um, I love Peter Eubin's book on Burundi, um, where he goes and he asks weird questions to people. Like, if you were president, what would you do? Um, and he's, he's got a whole list of these not good political science questions that just get these fantastic answers. And so the book, nobody cites it because it's so weird. Um, but it's great because it's got all these asking ordinary people what they think about politics. And it's so different from all of what the elites say and what everybody else says. So I highly recommend it if people don't know, don't know his book um, <clears throat> before he moved into administration and got sucked away from actually writing things. So sorry, Peter. Um, yeah, uh, I cannot read my handwriting at all, Eileen, on, okay, Unity. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, Tanzania is an interesting case because, um, like, looking, I, I've been writing on on religion and, and politics and how, in Congo, when Mobutu took away the church, the, the church's schools and um, and hospitals, that it led to this great tension. Whereas in Tanzania, Nyerere did the same thing, and he got the churches on his side. A lot of it had to do, with, frankly, with his personality and the degree to which, you know, he went to the churches and he talked it through with them and explained that, look, we've got this great project and we needed to be part of it. And he used Catholic theology to argue for the nationalization of churches and schools. And, and so, again, it comes to something political scientists don't like, which is the role of individual leaders and their personalities and the way they act. It's really hard to put that into formal models and to make it statistical. But, but when it gets down to it, I think it matters a lot. So... I, I, one of the themes running through this, and I think 
Crawford in his earlier work, I think less on the work on the state, but his earlier work, I think, did emphasize this sort of role of elites and and the power that they have to shape how politics happens. And I get more and more convinced by that the more that I study. Yeah, um, thank you, Tim. Um, I think the, the, the comment that you made, Michael, about the, the imperatives of, of taking emotions seriously in trying to understand the social and, and political processes. Uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with you completely that it's, it's, it's essential, it's, it's, it's very vital. Uh, and and not, not just to see emotions from a psychological perspective, but the way that it is appropriated by elites, for example, you know, in pursuing uh, political agendas and political goals. Uh, and especially now in the era of uh, populism, for example, how elites would use different forms of identity frames to whip up sentiments to pursue their goals. And, and, I, and I think this is where um, the legacy of Crawford becomes important about this idea of place-based research and interviewing. And I will echo what, what Scott was saying yesterday that a gathering like this and our role in supporting the initiatives being put in place, the type of graduate work that would eventually continue uh, with that legacy becomes very, uh, uh, very imperative. Uh, and I'm glad that you brought this, this idea so that uh, the more we get graduate students to do more deeper research in specific places, uh, uh, that would be very, uh, very helpful in, in accomplishing that goal. I, I, I do agree with you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my, uh, I have two questions, really, but uh, they're related. <clears throat> and um, it's to uh, Tim. Um, from Crawford Young's analysis of uh, ethnicity in the DRC, I conclude that he must have had a, a, a very close relationship to anthropology. Um, I mean, I'm neither an anthropologist nor a political scientist, but um, it seems to me that he had to have a deep knowledge of that in order to reach the conclusions that he did about you know, ethnicity not, not being important. And I know that uh, both in anthropology and in political science, the word tribalism has been banned, uh, but it's a word that, um, that is very much in Congolese daily lives, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, tribu et tribalism. Uh, in other words, you know, because the Lulua are in power now, they are being accused of being tri tribalists. Um, but if you go back to uh, politics in the Congo, you take an example of uh, a political uh, party like the Abako. It was very deeply, I mean, Abako is an uh, association de Bakongo. And, uh, and so the Bakongo obviously were, were very important as an ethnic group, still are. Um, and from that, then I, I, I jump over to, to Rwanda where there are only Rwanda and Burundi, uh, two ethnicities, the same language actually, <laughs> not even two uh, different ethnicities. And um, in Rwanda, if you ban, you know, the identity, um, identification of, of uh, tribal identity, is that a good thing? Uh, isn't the majority uh, remembering who they are and sooner or later it will, it will rise up uh, again? Um, whereas uh, in Burundi where there have been many, many similar conflicts, uh, they are recognizing that ethnicity does exist and let's deal with it. Um, so the, the
Tom, do you want to share anything at all? <laughs> yeah, there's, well, and it, you, it, was, it was very close to the time of the meeting. Your camera is off. Well, okay. Um, it was very close to the time of the meeting that I began to realize that I was going to have to say whatever I was going to have to say in 15 minutes. Now, I could have given myself 25 minutes like Tim Longman, but uh, it still would have been, wouldn't have been quite enough. Um, I want to comment on something about Crawford and Crawford's influence. And to emphasize something that I think we sometimes leave out of all of these discussions, um, which is the character of the political scientist in question. When we were in Lubumbashi, the book which became Rise and Decline of the Zairean State was really about finished. And it was set off to be reviewed and attacked. And according to Crawford, it was attacked by one of the members of our Rockefeller team. And it was attacked over the concept of state, which according to this writer, was kind of underdeveloped. And we should really read uh, Gould, for example, on the, the role of the state. Well, I've just sort of given away the point of the story. Um, Crawford, Crawford thought, thought that David Gould hadn't really understood how you do the re reviewing for university presses. You don't savage the, the text to the point where it gets postponed. And it took another five or eight years and in the meantime, he was almost done writing about cultural pluralism and he was doubling down on the state as he did for the next 20 years. Uh, Crawford is a very stubborn person and especially if he's attacked personally or what he sees as, as being attacked personally, he uh, does not deviate, he goes farther in that direction. And uh, I, was, I was okay with the amount of, uh, attention to the state that there was in in the, the text of which I was very much a, a junior author, of course. But um, he decided, okay, you guys don't think I, I, I or we uh, deal adequately with the state? Well, here you go. Here's some more state and some more state on top of that. And how would you like a third helping of state? And to the point where other considerations, including international uh, influences on this state or that state are, were really, uh, really subordinated. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that the, I, I think that there was a kind of an imbalance in his writings. And it's, it's interesting that when um, Tim talks about, uh, about Crawford's lessons for Congolese politics in recent years, uh, there's no question that, that instrumentalism works quite well. And, and uh, one, one might almost think that President Kabila had read about uh, Crawford Young. And so he gave, he says, Katanga's giving me a lot of trouble. I'll give him five Katangas. And he, and he did. And each of those little Katangas has a supposed ethnic uh, uh, indigenous community and they're supposed to control the uh, control the state government in that in that province and and so on and so forth and it made it almost impossible for the opposition uh, to unite behind one Katanga candidate against Kabila who after all was uh, and is a, a Katangan from the north so um, my, 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 my point is that that, that, that I think that uh, uh, that ex Lubum the Lubumbashi days were really kind of a pivoting point for, for Crawford on some of these things. And his, um, he went away from uh, being concerned primarily with ethnicity and cultural, cultural pluralism as he had been uh, doing up until then. Thank you very much. Okay, and, uh, thank you very much, Tom. Thanks to the panel.
All right, we have our last session, so let's let's uh, get started. Can we sit down? Grab your coffee, grab your snacks. All right, can we get started? Okay, so our next speaker is Joel Samoff from Stanford University, where he's been since 1980. Uh, he's also been a faculty member at the universities of California, LA, and Santa Barbara, uh, Michigan, and Zambia, and has taught in many other countries. Uh, he, his focus is on education and development, and he's worked in Tanzania, uh, Namibia, South Africa, and other, other countries. Uh, and now he's working regularly with international agencies and NGOs involved in African education. So join me in welcoming uh, Joel to talk about public policy, research, and foreign aid, dimensions of the financial intellectual complex. So yesterday I was the barrier, yesterday I was the barrier between all of you and the bar. Today I'm in the popcorn moment, so. I'll see if I can keep the popcorn moment going for a while. Uh, Crawford all his life, I think, had a tremendous interest, as you know, both in the post-colonial state of public policy and also in research. And I'm going to try to pull both of those together. But I also want to take this moment toward the end of our discussions together to try to push Crawford's thinking a bit beyond where he was going. And that is to think about external influences and to make the case that it's really not possible to develop explanations for Africa solely by looking at Africa. And I want to do that by starting with my own work on the politics of education. And to, to take off from there, I want to include in this uh, report on that work some attention to the process of knowledge creation. I also want to pick up on some of the comments that have come toward the latter part of our discussion about political science and about the direction of political science, which Crawford celebrated, but also troubled him, I think, in, in important ways. And I, I wanna focus a bit on that and because I think the research process gives us uh, some insight into how out, outside, inside, local, global intersect in what's happening in Africa. So let me begin with a story. I'm really beginning with the end of the story, but then I'll tell you how I got there. And the story is this. I was invited by some African colleagues particularly colleagues in Tanzania who work in an organization called Haki Elimu Education Rights, with whom I've worked over many years, to participate in a proposal for research funding. And they were interested in studying early childhood education. And we had some good discussions about the research they were interested in doing, about curriculum, curriculum development, about uh, early childhood education becoming more important in the education system. And then I began hearing about how they were going to go about doing their research. This is still a proposal in the, in the works that they're inviting me to participate in. And what they laid out was the kind of standard research design that you are all familiar with. There had to be a independent variable and dependent variable. There had to be inputs and outputs. There had to be a measure of before and after. Uh, there had to be, uh, ultimately, they wanted a randomized controlled trial. Uh, they had a whole structure of a kind of quasi-experiment, quasi because it was in the field, it wasn't in a lab, but uh, nonetheless, that experimental structure as what was standard social science. And I said, you know, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> You're trying to do work on a subject in an area in which that's really the wrong method. You're not starting by, what am I trying to find out and what's a good way to find it out? You're starting at the other end. You're starting with what is the method I can use and how can I apply it to something that I'm interested in? And why are you doing that? 
And they were very clear. We need to get funded. And they had a particular funding arrangement in mind, and they sent me to the website of the funding arrangement, and they were right. It was clear that the funding source, in this case, a funding source that prides itself in welcoming diverse approaches and diverse methods, but doesn't really, uh, they had a very good sense of what was necessary to get funded. And of course, if you take the next steps, we're all in academia, right? Why is it important to get funded? Well, they have to do research. Why is it important to do research? Well, they want to get salary increases. They want to get promoted. They want to get permanent positions at their institutions. They might want someday to become a chair or a dean or uh, something else like that. And for all of that, they needed to do research. And their institution was not a place that provided sufficient resources for them to do research. So that's the end of the story. How did they get there? And in some deep sense, how did we get there? How did we as an academic community get to the point of our African colleagues finding themselves in this situation? And so my next step in trying to sort all that out was I've done a fairly extensive review. I talked about it a bit yesterday in a talk in the School of Education of research on education in Africa over several decades. And, and that was a, a pretty powerful way of getting into all this because it turns out that there are striking continuities in that research. Different researchers, different topics, different funding sources, different places, different eras, and dramatic continuities. Continuities that I'm arguing are heavily related to continuity in what is considered to be high quality research. Not all that other stuff, but the research process as a driver of, uh, of what uh, that was about. And so I want to build, take that and build on that and add to that some work or extend some work that I did earlier, which I termed the financial intellectual complex, that is the arrival of foreign aid as a principal funding for a good deal of scholarship on education in Africa. African researchers who would like to do research on education look around for funding and don't find it in their institutions. Indeed, at the moment for education, the World Bank employs more researchers on education in Africa, directly and indirectly, than any research institute in Africa, than any university in Africa, and perhaps with the exception of South Africa, than all the rest of them put together. And so when they look around for funding for research, they end up recognizing that the external funding agencies are a primary source and they become effectively consultants to the external funding agencies. And that's a reasonable coping strategy. If Sweden's gonna support research, Canada is gonna support research, then it's reasonable to go in that direction to look uh, for funding for research. But what happens is that that process frames the research that they're going to do. And that framing is extraordinarily powerful. And I wanna take now just a few minutes to uh, touch on ways in which that framing is powerful so that I can end up back in the story I started with. Uh, and that is researchers are using a wholly uh, flawed method for trying to study something that really does worth, it is worth paying some attention to. I use the term framing simply to make the point that, I forgot who made it earlier, I think it was Joshua, but I make the point about context and about contextualizing how we understand things uh, really matters. Simple example, uh, when somebody does something that the society considers inappropriate uh, that is attributed to the abuse of alcohol, our general notion of dealing with that deviance is to talk to the miscreant, to uh, explain that is inappropriate behavior, but pretty quickly to reach out to police and courts and crime and law and say there are rules about alcohol and you've violated the rules and therefore you are to be sanctioned for violating the rules. But of course, we can also frame that abuse of alcohol as addiction and an illness. And then we're not dealing with courts and law and prisons, but we're dealing with remedy, diagnosis and remedy and treatment. And I'm only making the point that framing really matters. And is this a problem of law and violation? Is this a problem of, uh, of uh, an illness that can be that, that can be addressed. I have lots of other examples of that, uh, of all of these things, so ask me some more. So let's think about the framing then that is carried with this external funding for research. And I wasn't really gonna talk about this next 
part of the framing, but, but it really is important, I think. And that is the way in which this notion of traditional and modern, which all of us grew up with, all of us probably set aside at some moment, but comes across as a very powerful part of how it is that one is to understand Africa. And it helps us understand the continuities of the research process. So Europeans arrive in Africa, as you know, and they make this distinction between the civilized and the barbarian. And that helps them then justify treating one set of people one way and another set of people another way. Uh, civilized barbarian, civilized primitive. In the early 20th century, it's the academics who give a scientific legitimacy. Now we call it traditional, uh, modern and traditional, or sometimes developed and less developed. But there's this progress line and some are farther along on the progress line, some are farther back on the progress line. And what it carries with it is a notion of a kind of unchanging Africa. And what it carries with it for educators, for education researchers, is a kind of upbeat notion because now education can have a kind of social engineering purpose. It can help those who are farther back on the progress line get farther ahead on the progress line. And it makes uh, educators really feel very good, but it carries with it that deep sense of the unchanging Africa, that deep sense of Africa needs help in some way or other, and that it's an appropriate role for outsiders to bring whatever their help is. Now, I thought that language, you know, the civilized language went away, but I saw uh, a, a, a television report of a reporter who was interviewing Ukrainian refugees in Poland. And he said, very comfortably, that, you know, they're really quite civilized. They're not like other refugees. And so here we have Mudembe's notion of creation of the other. And the other, they're still out there. N not these Ukrainians, they're really quite civilized, like other Europeans, right? Uh, but those other refugees who are refugees from uh, Syria or from Eritrea or from somewhere else, they're, they're that other. So civilized is still with us. Let me touch on some more elements of the framing that comes along with this research. Uh, think about how people go about constructing explanations. There's this striking continuity, as I said in my review of research on education in Africa. 40 years ago, the quote was, education in Africa is in a crisis. And then 40 years later, the quote is, education in Africa is in a crisis. Now, and over the 40 years, all sorts of things have changed inside Africa, outside Africa. Uh, and yet, nonetheless, education in Africa is in perennial crisis, which then becomes, of course, uh, a, a rationale for the outsiders to intervene and help Africa get beyond its crisis. So they're asking uh, one more time, you know, why is Africa poor and looking for an explanation in Africa? But they're not asking, how is it that Africa that used to be rich got poor? How is it that Africa that used to have universities now has trouble getting basic literacy for a good part of the population? So they're constructing explanations and a priori the explanation has some constraints on it. And the constraints are, we're looking for an explanation within Africa about for things African. And we rule out of the discussion from the start, the notion that what's happening is an intersection of an external dynamic and an internal dynamic that is dramatically powerful. The framing carries with it some conceptions of education and how education is organized. The framing carries with it a notion of the role of public policy. Uh, when I look at the document, the source document for these colleagues I was talking about, it has a notion of public policy that in some sense we'd all really like, right? Researchers do good research. They find out important stuff. The policy readers read the important stuff that the researchers have found out, and lo and behold, they make good policy. Now, anybody who studies policy knows it doesn't work that way. Anybody who studies policy knows that there's a very complicated path between research of any sort and making policy. And we all know that often uh, the research that is cited in defense of a particular policy came next. That is, the policy was decided, and then research was brought forward to say, sure, this is a good policy. 
for those of you who work in the way I do in the, in the development environment, the key phrase is research shows that, and you can add whatever you want on the end, but if you don't begin with the research shows that, you can't be in the discussion. The research shows that that's the quick draw pistol, right? We're all sitting at the round table on policy discussions and whoever get that research shows that pistol out fast uh, gets an up in the discussion and gets to push the discussion uh, in a particular direction and to attribute to the research process uh, uh, whatever is the intended policy or policy direction. Now, along with the framing, um, along with the funding comes uh, a framing that has to do with what constitutes high quality research. I've already given you the example of the experiment as the model for what is high quality research. And so there's uh, dependent variables and independent variables and inputs and outputs and linear causality. And that of course pushes to the side other notions of how one explains things. It pushes to the side for education, the notion that education is much more important as a process than it is as an outcome. And it effectively blinds us to the process. We're busy with the inputs and the outputs and what happens in between is what educators call the opaque black box. We don't have to worry what happens in between. Uh, and there's a lovely quote in a World Bank document saying, you know, we don't really need to worry. As long as we pay attention to the inputs and the outputs, then we have an adequate understanding, a full understanding of what's happening. As you all know, this, uh, this uh, research, uh, this uh, framing carries along with it, the notion that counting is central to the story. That is that quantification is essential. So when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin in 1965, I sat in my first political science methods course and the instructor said to me, if you can't count it, it doesn't matter. And I thought, now that I'm a few years older, that we were well beyond that. And yet, and yet, and yet, if I look at the documents that are the documents that are to advise my colleagues on how to get their research proposals approved, it says effectively precisely that. Truth is connected to counting, and uh, if you don't count, you're not going to get there. One final notion of the framing is a maintaining of the disciplines. That is the disciplines as the managers of how one goes about doing research. And I was really struck in conversation with several people who are interested in this effort to decolonize higher education or decolonize education, particularly for the activists in South Africa and elsewhere. But remember, there was an effort to decolonize higher education in Africa at the moment of the transition from European rule to African rule. The University of Dar es Salaam tried to get rid of the disciplines in the early 1960s. Uh, in the middle 1960s and created uh, another sense of how one would organize the creation of knowledge. And basically it failed. The disciplines prevailed uh, with significant help from external funding, in this case, Rockefeller Foundation uh, and a bit the Carnegie Foundation. I have lots more to say about all this. I, I wanna round it off so we have time for, for Lou and for the, for the discussion. But what I've been trying to, the point I've been trying to make is that to extend what Crawford has been working on, to extend the notion of context, we need a sense of the intersection of an external dynamic and an internal dynamic. And we need to contextualize that as well. And we need to push back on that notion that we can explain things in Africa by looking only at Africa. And we need to push back on the notions that persist of Africa as a kind of unchanging place that that uh, it persists no matter what else uh, anybody is doing. And that means, it seems to me, we need to take seriously, I'm not been really very struck by the extent to which my colleagues here have found ways to pay deep attention to context, to pay deep attention to time, moment, place, event, and their interconnections. But that's not what's happening for African scholars who are trying to do research on education in 2022, who are dependent on foreign aid and other external funding. And that says to me that we need, that we have a significant responsibility. And we have a responsibility for finding ways to encourage research deviance. We need to find ways to encourage people to cross the disciplinary borders. We need to find ways to engage in collaboration 
that is an enabling collaboration that permits our African colleague, uh, colleagues, that enables our African colleagues to cross those borders and to pursue deviant strategies. In the hope that you're still awake with your popcorn, thank you. Thank you. And I neglected to mention that Joel got his PhD here in 1972, so one of the first students of Crawford's. Um, and then Lou Picard got his PhD here in 1976. Um, Lou Picard is the professor of international development at the University of Pittsburgh, um, and he uh, works on issues of international development, human security, governance, uh, development management, uh, local government, and civil society. He's worked in Eswatini, in Botswana, and South Africa. And we'll be talking about Beyond Survival, the Hidden Peoples of Uganda. First of all, I got, have to get my equipment here. I have to operate this clicker and, and this mic at the same time. So, uh, no, I, I need, I. Uh, I talk off the slides and of course you can't see them with, from my back, so. Um, a week ago, Kathleen Stout, Kathy Stout, uh, many of you know here, spoke at the University of Pittsburgh virtually, of course, uh, from El Paso. She talked about the liberation from academia. And uh, this was brought about by her retirement she retired several years ago. She's now an activist on the borderlands, as she describes it, uh, after an illustrious career writing on uh, academically. She felt liberated. And while the term retirement still scares me, the liberation idea is something that I, uh, I relate to, and I want to try to do that today. Um, one quick comment about Crawford, and then I will uh, we'll, uh, move on, because... We, being the last person here is, uh, is at least as much of a challenge as anything. Uh, the thing I remember about Crawford were the 12-page single-spaced notes on yellow paper on a typewriter without typos. Now, most people, you know, you, you do not not make typos when you're typing on a typewriter. So that's the Crawford story. So... What I'm going to do today, very briefly, uh, is mainly share with you some images. Let's see if this works. There we are. Uh, talking a little bit about a subject that I'm new to, uh, what we call hidden peoples, and a project that has developed in the last uh, eight, or, eight or nine years. I spent a lot of time working on South Africa before that, Botswana. Uh, Tanzania and, and so forth. I worked and lived three years in Uganda, was going to do my dissertation research there. Uh, I was going to arrive uh, in 1971-72. Uh, not, a, not a good year to go research uh, uh, Uganda. So instead, I wandered off further south and, and in, a, in uh, a number of other directions. But I came back in 2008 with my wife, Pauline, and we re-involved ourselves, or I re-involved myself with her in, in Uganda, a, a place that uh, I almost grew up in. I was so young when I got there. Uh, this is a partnership between our social, uh, ASA Social Fund for Hidden Peoples and the University of Pittsburgh that involves a whole team of students uh, working uh, out of the university's African Studies program. And what I'm trying to do here now is to think about the movement from research, academic research, to policy dialogue and policy communication to a situation in which one can articulate uh, to the general public, to the public beyond academics. Since we can talk pretty well to each other, I'm not so sure that we can talk as well uh, to people who are not referent to political science, to academia uh, or to the African continent. So I think it's better for me to click that direction. I, I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly and then I'm going to share some images with you. 
caution, I, you're not gonna like these images. You may not like the way we've selected them, but I, what I wanna try to do is to get a sense of if one is not an academic, if one is not uh, a, a, a person uh, who is particularly in, engaged in Africa or other parts of the world, what, what, what you should see and think about when you hear about Africa. I'm gonna talk about hidden peoples. There, there are many ways which you can think about them. They can be first origin. Many of you know more about this than I do. They could be threatened people from a race, a gender, an ethnicity, or a language perspective. They can be endangered to the risk of extinction. How do they become marginalized? marginalized? They can be marginalized for social or mental challenges in war and peace. It involves children, women, peoples with special needs, physical and physical and mental. And of course, images, of course, go around the world. The, the Roma, the Dalit, the, the San, these are all examples of an indigenous peoples. And, and, and of course, in addition to thinking about the status at birth, there are also marginalizations that occur through the abandonment of, of children, street, street kids, kidnapping, child soldiers, all of which we know uh, too well, marginalization from subordination or exclusion from the social system, brutality, rape, female and male, violence, acid attacks, burns, and this general atomization process that involves levels of shunning, exploitation, and of course, ultimately leading, leading uh, uh, to death. So, the social issues facing uh, many of the countries that we work in have not changed. I won't read through them. We've been talking about them uh, all day, uh, except of course, thinking about this from a comparative perspective, the lack of change as, as, we, uh, as Joel has just spoke about is incredible. Uh, there's very little that we can change here, uh, at least in terms of, uh, 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 progress, perhaps a little bit, but not, not very much. There we go. So, uh, again, these images, most of which uh, we took ourselves, not this particular, but this, of course, anywhere in the world is the formula for for disaster: extreme poverty, uh, militarization, particularly through schism, through civil war, through conflict, uh, leading to the the definition of non-humanness, uh, ultimately uh, a, a kind of mental hiddenness that, that occurs. Sorry about that. So the Uganda case study, uh, I'm gonna talk about it in very general terms, the way I would do presenting to a group of people in Pittsburgh who have other interests. And, and so some of this will not be as clearly uh, articulated as it should be. I'm going to generalize. I'm going to say things that are kind of dumb some, sometimes and show you a couple of pictures that are really dumb. So we're talking in a sense of a country which has gone through this schism. Uh, I call it the three nations, but really it's the two nations that we'll come back to. The, uh, the existence of both internal and external refugees that is simply built over the years the anger and the resentment that occurs from this. There are, what, 2,500 2, refugees in Uganda right now, uh, and growing, obviously. This is a difficult nation, uh, neighborhood to, uh, to, to, uh, to live in, and, and the movement has been incredible. It, of course, marginalization has occurred in Uganda as so many places in the world, both in war and in peace, and the, the the issue of, of, of hiddenness leads to the question of how does one move as an individual from victim to survivor? Uh, and how does a, a society in schism uh, restore governance, particularly as, as, as uh, society continues to schism uh, over time? And of course, this is the map that most people who work in East Africa know the five uh, kingdoms, and then the rest, the north. The five kingdoms in the north, in many ways, 
define the internal as well as the out, uh, outside image of, uh, of Uganda. This is the, uh, I'm simply gonna say this is the two nations. The, the border when you cross uh, is, is a real border and it's, a, it's the border that uh, takes you from Kampala to Gulu. These are, these are nations obviously that have evolved over time. They've changed in the, in the time that I've been going to Uganda. Uh, and of course, they reflect the, the increasing schism that has occurred, continues to occur, and more than anything else, in my view, uh, provides a challenge for the, the future of the, of the country. And of course, the challenge does not start here, but of course, this is a symbolism. It's a long time ago now when we, uh, we had a king as president in Uganda. Uh, uh, a particularly unique contribution that the British gave to, uh, to the Uganda Protectorate. Uh, the, the, the beginnings of this schism obviously go back to the 19th century and the division uh, of the continent as a whole. But of course, uh, this led to the, uh, uh, the Milton Obote Idi Amin coup in 1966. And this is the dumbest picture I've ever taken. And you can figure out why. You don't take pictures of military vehicles in front of your house. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I was, I probably would not take the picture today, but I'm kind of glad I did. So then we get a, 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 a crew of leaders afterwards. Of course, uh, all of you know the images, uh, but in particular, the uh, the role that uh, Uri Museveni play, plays still as, as president for life uh, in a country which has its, ha, has its unique uh, definition of, uh, uh, of, of governance, an important one that we'll come back to. Katwe, uh, the urbanization process as it's seen from the center of Kampala, No, we got too fast. Yeah. And of course, this brings us to the, the, the near present, the, uh, the uh, Gulu situation from 86 on up, uh, Joseph Kony and friends and the Lord's Resistance Army. Now, we're not looking at the conflict itself. We're looking at the, okay. We're looking at the, uh, 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 the impact of it on uh, uh, Uganda today. And I'm, I'll, I'll go very quickly. Um, I will just simply say that the research project looks at these issues, hiddenness, marginalization, the way it uh, isolates people from within the country and isolation within the, within the country itself. And then I move on to our attempt to try to capture this visually as well as in, a, in, in an academic uh, manuscript. And we're, we're looking at four th things that impact people and trying to understand where they have been, where they come from, and where, they, uh, where they're going. So uh, I will uh, very quickly just go through the, some of the images here. We're in the process of making a film on Gulu life, trying to translate what happens in another part of the world into a situation that people here uh, who are not particularly involved or engaged uh, can understand. Oops. The, uh, basically the uh, filming is, uh, uh, it, 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 I think I, I just have to say, People are willing to engage themselves in this process because of a hope and anticipation that their story uh, will, will get out. Some images, very, very, very briefly. Uh, these are people who have on the ground been impacted by, by the war, uh, particularly in terms of physical challenges. Uh, our focus is on uh, marginalized stories of hidden people 
articulated by themselves uh, and accompanied by, uh, by an attempt to try to capture uh, their, their attempt to, try to, to reinstate themselves within the context of uh, uh, the present situation. Um, our, our So we're now uh, going back again. We've been, uh, we were there in November. We're going back in May uh, to try to finish up. Uh, my wife, Pauline Greenlick, if you could stand up, is producing this uh, with uh, a filmmaker friend from Pitt, Will Zavala. And we're, we're gonna try to look at the situation of restoring them, uh, people to, from marginalization to in fact the uh, a condition of survivor as opposed to a condition of uh, a victim. And finally, I'll just uh, wrap up by saying a few words about the way in which we're engaged in a, in a uh, direct sense, professional development, professional engagement involving students from the University of Pittsburgh, working on a project that tries to uh, recreate uh, on an individual small scale level, a situation where, where people can, uh, can work, uh, can gain access to education and to escape from the challenges of uh, physical or, or mental disability. I'll flip through this very briefly, uh, looking at different uh, images of groups that we've been working with engaging, including acid attack victims, uh, uh, now survivors, and looking at uh, images of before and after, particularly when we're, we're looking at the situation between the, the North and, uh, and the situation, particularly this is in Lyra, uh, where uh, disaster has occurred, where 500 people were died, uh, died in Berlonia, which is low by uh, international standards, but in a, but in a small village, uh, very important. Uh, last comment, and I'll stop. Uh, we're working in the North specifically with something called the Women's Advocacy Network, which is a group of women who have been, uh, who have, all of, have been uh, essentially captured as kids, as women, as, as girls in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Baikoni and the LRA. And I'll stop uh, right there. Thank you. We're, we're basically at the end of our program. I think it's been a long day. It's, but let me just see if there is one question that someone feels a burning need to, to ask. Maybe someone, yeah, Gay. Yeah. You can limit yourself to one. Yeah, I will. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Joel, I don't know where you are, Joel. So, I have a question for Joel. I want to know how different that kind of research on education in Africa is from the kind of education that's being done today in the United States on education. Because I understand your argument that it's basically from outside pressure, but it seems kind of familiar. <laughs> if I got the question, Jay, is, is the pressure to do research in a particular way unique to Africa? No. Uh, it, the pressure to do research in a particular way has a very broad reach. And I was trying to end my comments by saying it seems to me we have a responsibility as scholars, not only for the, our own research and the research that we do, but the organizations that are the monitors and managers and funders. In this case, because of the foreign aid funding, the foreign aid funders become the arbiters of research quality. And so there is a very clear path uh, in that direction. But yes, I think it's much broader. Thanks. I think in the interests of time, we should, um, I think, move forward. Um, I want to thank both presenters for, for, their, for their presentations. We are going to turn now to
it. You can unmute and turn on the video. Saying we can't. Nope, the host needs to stop. Okay, we're, we're not. Ralph, can you hear me? Uh, please turn on your camera and uh, feel free to speak. Uh, we can't turn on the camera because it says the host has stopped it. Is there anything you can do there? Yes. Thank you. No, it's saying we can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Now you should be able to turn it on. Yes, there we go. Mm -hmm. Am I on? Mm -hmm. oh, cool. oh. uh, I, uh, I do apologize that the accelerated um, increase of oh, COVID cases here in England has, has kept me on this side of the Atlantic, rather than joining you in, in Madison. It, it really has been a great pity. But on behalf of Crawford's family, I would like to express our deepest thanks to uh, all you have contributed, contributed to the presentation, both of um, personal reflections about Crawford yesterday and to the excellent uh, symposium today. I want to give thanks foremost to your hosts and academic organizers, uh, professors, Annie Tripp, uh, Scott Strauss, and Michael Schatzberg. And of course, we owe particular thanks to the more than 20 former colleagues of Crawford, uh, professional associates, uh, postgraduate, former postgraduate students of Crawford who have come forward with such stimulating contributions. We certainly have been moved by the scope of the program and by the, the sheer range of interests which have uh, been on display. This diversity owes a great deal to the breadth of Crawford's own interests in the development of African studies at, at Wisconsin and his, his capacity to assist students whose own interests covered such a, a range of, of research areas. I should add, though, I should add to the acknowledgments that we've had of Crawford's influence on his students that this was always, I think, a two-way process, and that Crawford was learning from your own effort, efforts just as you may have felt you were benefiting uh, from his wise, wise counsel. I certainly never sent Crawford a draft of some project I was working on without receiving back some very thoughtful comments, always very gentle in their phrasing, and some recommendations, some recommendations of additional literature I should be consulting. Now, finally, the family are delighted to learn that as part of Crawford's permanent legacy, a book is planned uh, based on the papers contributed to this sym symposium, and we certainly look forward to its appearance in the coming months. There is also to note the special scholarship which has been established to support a student through their doctoral program in political science and African studies. This fund, I can report now, has a strong base and promises many interesting returns on our collective investments for the future. Finally, many thanks again to the organizers uh, and particularly uh, for uh, uh, Alea Ang Anguli McCord uh, and her team at Wisconsin's African Studies Center uh, for doing so much to allow me to find these few minutes at the end uh, for uh, uh, a few closing words.
rather than Eileen's, I, she asked me to close, which I'm happy to do. Um, I do want to just reiterate something that Ralph said, which is that the African Studies team has been awesome uh, in terms of their. Um, and a particular shout out to to Harry Kiru, who I think was the the really the you know the sort of nerve center of the of the logistics, um, but uh, to Aliyah McCord. Um, to uh, Olainka Olegbegi Adegite, and to Joya Headley and Cecilia Kialo, who also were uh, in the background. Um, so I also want to just thank all of you for, for being here and for, I think, honoring Crawford's legacy by spending, you know, day and a half in Madison or on Zoom. Um, and for the presenters, I mean, I think this was just a fabulous, I mean, it was, it's just extraordinary to me to think about the range of Crawford's influence, right? I mean, um, uh, both, you know, across the continent, across the themes, but also well beyond the continent, I think as Gina's paper and Josh's papers and other papers, you know, have, have indicated that this was a scholar of incredible range and incredible influence and an enduring legacy. Um, so I wanna thank all the presenters for the time that they put into the work and to the presentations that they made here you know, today. It was really fabulous. We do hope to uh, put together a volume of some kind. Uh, I think you know, in some ways picking up on what Joel said at the end, which I think I, you know, at least in our vision would be a book that someone could pick up and um, see what Croft, you know, the way that Crawford Young thought and, and his approach to politics and what we can learn from that and how we can put that in dialogue with um, contemporary political science or just in general. Uh, and I think the papers, I think, brought that out in, in, their dem in, 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 the, in the work that they were doing and how they did that work and the kind of respect they, 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 in which they dealt with their subjects. So I think that's hope, you know, hopefully something we can kind of pull together, but would really love your input on that and love that to be a dialogue in the sense that, you know, Eileen and I will try to write an introduction that captures much of the, what was said here thematically, but we really appreciate any input you have just any, at any time you can send us both an email, um, but once also we have a draft, we would love to get um, some feedback on it. Um, so, um, what a man, what a, what, a, what a man, what an incredible human being, what an incredible legacy. And um, I'm, I'm sorry to close because it's, you know, it feels like a closure, which is, which is hard. So I think, you know, it's incumbent upon us to, to carry forward his legacy, his ideas, his memory, uh, his example, as, as all of you spoke about over the last day and a half. And um, so, I don't know, a salute to, to Crawford. Thank you all for being here and um, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.